Hey, what's up everybody? How's it going? My name is Ian Robinson and I do fun stuff like make cool stuff and things and stuff. This is such a great intro. Welcome. What's going on everybody? Uh, are there tutorials uh, for ZBrush? Absolutely. There are tons of tutorials for ZBrush, 100%. And uh, yeah, actually, to get straight into that right out the gate, I can actually take you over because we have, uh, we actually have some Ass ZBrush videos, which are on our YouTube channel. So if you actually come over here to YouTube and type in Ass ZBrush, you'll go ahead and you'll see a lot of that. Also too, if you go to maxon.net, and don't worry, I'll be dropping links here in a second. If you go to maxon.net and go up to learn, Cineversity, you'll actually see that there are a ton of tutorials getting started with ZBrush, Redshift, Cinema, etc. And we also have moved over the Z Classroom, which people have come to know and love over many years, on over to maxon.net, and you can actually come through and select beginner, intermediate, or even advanced tutorials. So here, let me drop those links in the chat right now. How is everyone doing? Aw, oh, Chase, what's happening? <laughs> You're so kind, Chase. Uh, no, from your libraries, I'm asking. Oh, from my libraries. Um, currently, I don't have any new tutorials on my personal channel. Um, however, if you have questions, I'm here now. We can ask and we can do stuff. So let's go. Yeah, I just, I personally have not had time to do a lot of that stuff um, on my own. Uh, however, I do have a Discord in which um, I hang out in quite often, and there's a lot of really cool people. A lot of fun artists that hang in there as well. So this is a, that's a good opportunity as well to come in and actually ask questions. We have some volunteer instructors uh, as well as myself. You could tag me anytime. So, but then also too, I'm planning on doing a few more stuff uh, in my on my off time. So I'll have more of that coming soon. So do not worry. Uh, what's up? What's up? All right, let's get some fun music. Let's do that first. So we're gonna go ahead and hit play. And uh, I like to listen to music. I try to play it so everybody can hear it. So if you can hear it, that's cool. But I try not to let the music overtake too much. So yeah. Shade almost sounds really different. Oh, it's the title. Ah, I forgot to adjust the title. That's my fault. Um, I will have to go ahead and... Yeah, let me see if I can do that real quick. <laughs> Hi, what's going on? I'm Shane Olson, and I make 3D characters. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry, Shane. <laughs> Here, let me see if I can do that real fast. Uh, uh, let me update the titles. There we go. Let me do a come see how it's made with Ian Robinson. I'll go ZBrush. So we are using 2024, which is always super cool. Um, so let's go ahead and pop that stuff off right there and let's update. So if you refresh the actual stream, you'll see the new updates on that. <laughs> all right, cool. So now that all that is done and out the way, let's, let's see what we can do with the sphere today. So the thumbnail suggested that I was going to do some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and I had done a Leonardo not too long ago. And I feel like now I kind of still want to stick on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle theme. So we're going to be doing, we're going to be doing something fun. Let's see who can guess it. So let's turn on my tablet. Let's start with that. We can't sculpt without a tablet. So let's get that situated. Probably should plug it in. Let's see here. How is everybody's start of the 2024? Hopefully everybody's having a good time. There we go, all right. Let's see, tablet is engaged. Is it, let's see, it's engaged, boom, it's engaged. We have the ability to do some sculpting. Fun stuff. Hey, what's up, Ryan? What's... Uh, let's see, question, can you explain the tools that we should focus on and layer arrangement? ZBrush is confusing and uh, one can get lost with all the wrong tools, wasting time. So can you target the tools that we need? Mm, great question. That's a fantastic question. And absolutely. So as everyone knows, ZBrush is 100% feature stacked with a ton of really cool features. In fact, ZBrush is known to basically, if you can think it, you can create it. It's really that simple. However, I do know what you mean by there being a lot of different options and you don't, you want to get into the creative process and you don't really want to waste your time. So the first things first is let's hit B for brush. 
here are the brushes that I, I, I highly recommend that you, you play with out the gate if you're just focused on sculpting. But at the same time, I'm going to encourage you, please go through and test all of these brushes and see what does what and kind of make some mental notes. Because if you familiarize yourself with like three to five brushes, you could do a lot with just those brushes. So that's the first thing is go through the brush set. One of my favorite, of course, is actually the clay buildup or even the clay brush, which is a great one. So that's always a good way to start, especially if you're just going to start sculpting. In fact, we're going to be using the clay brush a lot today um, because you can see it does some kind of cool brainy things. Hint, hint, wink, wink. So um, the other thing, too, is really only kind of it's more of like you're playing than anything else, but I use Dynamesh a lot in my main feature, which I think is really cool. It's very helpful to get something really quickly and rebuild the geometry, especially for tearing. So you really should be focusing on, as you're sculpting, how can I rebuild my topology quick? And this is where Dynamesh has changed the game because I can just come in and start making some random, you know, some random shapes, but then I can break my topology and I can rebuild that. So it's definitely a lot of fun. It got really quiet in here. I think my music paused. Um, I'll answer, I'll finish the question first. And then um, the other thing too, to really think about is really folders. Folders are my big one. So if you hit control F, that's gonna go ahead and let you say, let's just call this brain. Boom, just gonna put this tool in a folder. What's cool about this is being able to keep everything in an organized fashion. So if you're doing clothing, put your clothing in a clothing folder. If you're doing weapons, weapons folders. You're breaking up the body into torso and you have different components and you wanna add more to that torso, then you can do that. So the, the folder system is something that you should really be paying attention to as well. Now you mentioned layer arrangement. So I was assuming you meant with the sub tool visibility. And one of the things I like to recommend is I like to stack my tools in kind of an order of operation. If this was a full character, in fact, let me do that real quick. Let me open up this demo soldier to just kind of showcase that. If this was a full character like this, I would put my character on top, right? But then I would put things that are associated together, like this vest and this shirt. I would group these in a folder. And if you don't know, what you could do is turn on your gizmo by hitting W get that pizza box going on there. And then what you could do is just select the things that you want. So like, let's say I want the vest and the shirt. I'll select those two items, hit control F. It's gonna say, do you wanna put all those visible tools into a folder? And you say yes, and then you just say, okay, this is a uh, shirt. Boom, and then now everything associated with that shirt goes into there. And you can same thing here, like I need you know, my uh, my boots and my knees, my knee pads to be in one group. So I'll just select those and call those boots. So it's really helpful. And then I like to, again, just kind of keep everything in an organized fashion. So maybe the rest of the stuff here, I'll go ahead and say, you know what, let's select all this, but deselect those. We'll put the rest, except for the creature here, and we'll call this accessories, right? And now I have all of this kind of labeled. Oh, I didn't put the goggles in there. Here's a cool part is that if you make a folder and then you go through and like, oh, I forgot that part, like the goggles, I could just remake that folder. So accessories, if I could spell. And now that redoes that. So now I have my shirt, my boots, and my accessories. And I try to keep this in some sort of order of operation. So that's for organization. I definitely agree with that. If you meant the actual layer system, this is a whole conversation on its own. But typically, if you were to do like, let's say real fast, I'm just gonna answer everything <laughs> all at once. If you were to wanna make changes to this folder, I mean, to this top layer, try to think of it as the layer stack. It's a little backwards. It starts from the top and then it works its way down. And each layer is on top of each other. So it's a little backwards. So you got layer one, two, three, four, five, six, but it's but think of it as being stacked on top of each other. It's just working its way down because each layer affects the previous layer. That's the easiest to remember it. So if I do a quick thing where I'm like sculpting right here on this layer, and then I say, okay, I'm done. I need, and I don't wanna make any more adjustments to this layer. If I do another layer and I stack on top of it, and then I stop recording, you'll notice here that when I adjust this bottom layer, notice it's also affecting the, the layer that's on top of it. So that's the stacked order of that. So that, that's, a, that's a lot in a nutshell. 
but hopefully that is helpful. What's up, Leonard? What's up, Ryan? Haven't sculpted anything in 2024 yet. Managing a studio now. Oh, good for you, man. That's awesome. Congrats. That's a lot of work for sure. Okay, let's see if I can get Pretzel Rocks working. Pretzel Rocks has lately seemed to have pretty much locked everything for me. I guess I should probably create an account now. Let's see here. All right, that's cool. We'll stick with that. We'll see what happens. Kind of like Photoshop and how options are there just in case of uh, the production reasons, like being on a team. Yeah, that's a great way to think about it. Absolutely. Hi, Saya. How you doing? Kate Wynn, how's it going? Awesome. Great question, by the way, and good way to start the year. All right, so let's go back to... I'm going to go ahead and open this up. So if you're new into ZBrush and you want to know how I start my files, if I'm not starting from a base mesh that I created, I pr pretty much come up to the light box by hitting that comma key, double-clicking that default project, bada-bing, bada-boom, we got ourselves a sphere, which is awesome. So, again, I'm going to let you guys kind of guess the character, so to speak. So I'm going to put this over here so then my, my quote, uh, my reference is off a little bit. But uh, you guys can guess the character. I'm going to see who gets it first. And uh, I don't know, maybe maybe 20, maybe, maybe 20 uh, non-necessary IR sculpt points. <laughs> Let's go. All right, so I'm going to use the clay buildup. And I'm actually going to pick Alpha 18. Uh, it's just a brush that I seem to like quite a bit. And we're going to go ahead and first we're going to map out the face. There is a face to this. Boom. So we're gonna get some eye sockets up in here. Mm. Boom, boom, boom. How is everybody's 2024 New Year's? Did everybody get what they wanted for Christmas and such? All right, let's get that clay brush. That's cloth brush, so BCL. I'm gonna use the clay brush this time. Now I could have used the clay brush to dig in, but I actually like the way the clay buildup digs in a bit better. So we're gonna do a little bit of his eyebrows, kind of get a nice little shape here. Now I'm actually going to try to avoid smoothing as much. We're gonna up the resolution a bit. So if you wanna avoid smoothing as aggressively, my tip for you is actually turn off smoothing RGB and actually drop it down to a super low number, like let's say 30. And the reason why is because you won't smooth as aggressively. So if you're like, I need to smooth, it kind of controls it. I think a lot of times, at least for me, I have gotten to the habit of smoothing too much. And then that can actually cause a little bit of uh, fighting the geometry, so to speak. And we don't want that. Okay, cool. <laughs> Did you, uh, sorry, oh, <laughs> yeah, Nightbot's weird. Nightbot does not absolutely love the uh, the emotes. I think Nightbot needs to, like, calm down for five seconds. People get excited, okay? Okay, Nightbot? <laughs> How dare you, K-Twin. All right, let's get this kind of shaped up here a little bit. Gaming characters. Uh, oh, you want a heavy armored character modeling tutorial. Ooh. Actually sounds like fun. Okay, I'm going to turn off perspective for five seconds because it's not. So you know what? What, what I'll tell you, uh, what I'll tell you I'll do is I will do a little bit of uh, research. I'll do a little bit of uh, checking on that. I have some, you know, we're going to shows and stuff, you know, we're doing like, you know, like we guarantee we'll be doing a lot of shows this year. So I'm always looking for fun projects. So a heavy armored character actually sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, all right. I feel like it's time to do the, the, the biggest change of them all. Uh, the thing that should identify this character pretty quickly. And we're gonna kind of do this in a T posy way. We're gonna start with that. All right. Any guesses so far? <laughs> Any guesses on what we're doing here? All right. Okay. I'm now gonna use the damn standard. Woo! 
Will Star Mojo, look at you. Already, yes, 100%. Man, I was like, I knew it was going to be pretty, uh, I figured it would be a pretty good guess. Absolutely. You guys are right, 100%. Oh, yeah. We're going to try to kind of make them our own, if you know what I mean. Got some good references and stuff like that. In fact, actually, what I'm going to do too, I kind of want to make them a little bit more towards the realistic side. So let's go ahead and save. And let's go ahead and save over what we had started. And I want to actually pull up a human brain. Now, I'm going to kind of move this off to the side a little bit. And I'm going to have some human brain references. I really just want to kind of see, you know, make sure what that reference looks like and get something a little bit more towards that right. I know he has some identifying markers that make him a little bit unique, but we're going to maybe change it up just a little bit. Whoa, 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 whoa. Calm down there. Calm down there. There you go, Ian. All right. BDS. Let's go ahead. Let's do this. So I'm going to cause a little brain split right down the middle. So I'm going to press and hold shift. I'm going to start my drag, press and hold shift let go and that's going to give me a nice little center point right here and then let's go with my move infinite and kind of crush that brain just a little bit there we go oh snap yep <laughs> 20 points for you <laughs> it was a wild guess but you guessed you guessed right you guessed right absolutely all right, so this is why I'm actually going to be using the clay brush because the clay brush does this fun little buildup process where it kind of stops and it gives you some like nice little weird shapes, right? And so here, especially with the way the character is designed, so now that we guessed it, you know, let me see here. So the, the fun part is, and I'll show you my reference now that we've now that we've guessed it. So here's our character, right? And he just he's just kind of a blob of a mess. So this is what's really fun about this character, is that you can pretty much do whatever you want. As long as it kind of looks like a brain, it works out for you. So we're gonna be sticking him on this kind of tripod wheel thing here. Um, because I really like the fact that he's like world dominating, wants to do a thing. I also love the expressions that you find with him in this chair. That's always super cool. So we're gonna be doing it based off of that. But you can see here, he's just kind of this weird mess. And that's why I like him. And we gotta have a villain. You can't just always sculpt heroes. <laughs> How come uh, we never use the ZBrush tag on other streams? Uh, no idea. No idea. Guess it's time to start tagging a little bit more. Might have a lot of questions today. Hey, no problem, Sheriff. Please do. Please do. I'm just going to be going through and making some fun stuff, doing some things, keeping it weird. That's how we roll. So, what's also really cool is like if you're not quite sure how you want to approach some of the shapes to it. What we can always do is just get something on the canvas. This is an approach I take quite often, where you're just kind of getting stuff there. And we can always refine. So we're just, I'm not even worried about the direction of where a lot of this stuff goes. I just want it to feel blobby. All right, we can always refine later. Right now, we're just getting something on. Cool. All right, let's get some eyeballs in here. So again, so what I also like to do, and this is something I like to do a lot, which is the first subtool in ZBrush gets named whatever you called your file. So in this case, you know, we got uh, Krang block out, right? So what I like to do a lot of times is make sure that there's a kind of like a throwaway subtool. So either I turn around and, and make the sphere something else like it is. So I'll do like maybe the sphere would be it. Or sometimes I'll just duplicate the mesh. If it's a base mesh, I usually use the base mesh, duplicate it, and then work off of an additional one. So let's come back here. Let's just do save as. Let's copy over this block out and then we can actually call him Crane. Boom. 
and we can actually call this the body because why not we're keeping it simple and then here i'm actually going to go ahead and we're going to insert some eyes so we're going to grab the sphere real quick now here's a fun little trick for you we're going to grab the insert primitive the imm primitive brush and what's fun about this is that i'm going to select one of these ones up here. I think Sphere 32 is the one I'm going for. It's a little less dense. So I'm gonna hit W to bring up the gizmo, and I'm gonna go ahead and select Sphere 32. And that automatically, and you can do it with the arrow keys as well, but what that does is with that gizmo out, it'll allow you to switch out whatever your current subtool is for another one of your choice in the way, of course, that it was drawn out. So we're actually going to drag that out. Now this puts the pole for the eyes exactly in the direction that I want that to be. And so now I can just go ahead and move this forward. Do a scale down. And start positioning this in his face. And what's really fun is I like to angle the eyes out just a little bit. Human eyes, when they're, or any type of eyes really, when they're looking straight on the camera, your eyes are actually slightly tilted out. If they're straight on, then they tend to look a little cross-eyed. And that's never a good look. So I always angle it out just a little bit. It feels a little bit more natural to me. And then I'm gonna go ahead and do a geometry modified topology mirror and weld on the X axis. And now we have these eyeballs. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit D for dynamic subdiv, which will put me in that spectrum. And then we can just adjust this as needed. There we go. And then we'll rename these eyes. Just why not? Hit save. So you joined late. We just started. The party just started. Don't you worry. How do you extrude? How did you extrude those limbs? When I use the move tool, I often end up lose. Uh, it often ends up being all glitchy. So I am using a combination of the snake hook brush, which allows you to do something like this. But yes, it gets all glitchy. And then what I do is I go to geometry and make sure that Dynamesh is turned on. I'm gonna drag this out and then I'll rebuild that topology. Another way you could do it actually, and this is recommended when you pick the snake hook brush, it's actually gonna pop up and says this brush performs best with Sculptures Pro. So you can say, okay, so you come up here, turn on Sculptures Pro, and then as I drag this out, so I get a nice big brush. So rebuilding that topology for you as you go. And I can make a bigger brush and I'll just rebuild that. So that's another approach I could have taken as well. But I just use DynaMesh, as DynaMesh is one of my favorite features and I just use it so much. So, and then two, we can always come in and do some inflation, make that a little bit more mesh and then drag that out and we're good to go. So pretty simple approach, nice and easy, keep it loose. Hi, Poppy Janya from India. Welcome, welcome. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you for being here. Glad to have a fan. It's always nice. Thank you so much. Yep, yep, yep. Got to be careful with that quick replacers. If you forget the right mesh, you just ruined what you're working on. Yeah, yeah, you know, you do want to be careful. Absolutely. You know, because if you come up here, and that's a valid point, if you come up over here and then you do this, then you, uh, yeah, you have a tendency to kind of overwrite that. However, I just controlled Z to get that back. So if you accidentally do that, you're picking the wrong one, and then you're like, okay, all of this is happening, just control Z, back that up. You'll, it's only gonna be a problem if you delete it or if you shut it down and then you're like, oh my God, I didn't mean to do that, and you forgot to save. Um, or if you saved over and you overwrote that. So yeah, definitely be careful. All right. So again, we're gonna kind of just make this a big of a mess. And now I wanna flatten the underside, but I don't wanna do this. this I don't, I don't wanna just have like a sharp flatness. That's, that's not what I want. So I'm actually gonna press control and shift together. Then I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm gonna press the space bar, control shift together. And I'm gonna adjust the intensity. I could have also just come up here, but I like popping up this little menu and that's how you can do that. So then I'm gonna come in, double tap. Hold shift like this. I'm gonna move this over like this. I'm gonna do a lighter flatten, something like that. So that lower intensity just kind of crushes that just a little bit. So it's not super flat and that's that's more of what I'm going for. 
Now let's go ahead and grab the clay buildup and let's actually start focusing a bit on his eye. I'm actually going to let's give him a little bit of an expression. And let's respect the eye anatomy here. So we're going to be pushing these brows in, give him a little bit of a nostril flare to his brain. Breaking all the rules of what a brain looks like. <laughs> but it's so cool. I love this guy. This guy's fun. There we go. Awesome. Now we have to decide if we want to give him a mouth bag at some point, which actually that might be kind of cool because then we could probably take him into uh, Substance and then eventually take him into Cinema 4D and maybe do a little bit of an animation. So maybe we could do that. Actually sounds like fun. How do we set up topology for animation for, or for 3D printing? Thanks. Actually, I'm just I'm just thinking about that right now. 3D printing, it's a lot easier in my world. I come from toys and 3D printing and manufacturing, so doing that's going to be pretty simple. The key with that is just making sure that it's quote watertight uh, and that it looks and feels good um, because you don't you know if it's a nice solid mesh, then you ultimately aren't going to have any real problems. Uh, the game ready animation, you know what? Let's push him. Let's do it. Let's just, let's push that. Now he's a brain with a mouth. So the biggest part we're going to have to really worry about is his mouth and eyes. And I'm just literally throwing little random shapes here. I'm not really thinking about this too terribly. I mean, he's he's a he's a brain with with eyes and a mouth. So who's to say that these these lobes don't go this way? <laughs> a little bit of creative freedom here. So I don't like that though. So let's do this. There we go. Okay, great. Okay, now let's move along. We're not really worried about detailing, but let's get some teeth in here. So I'm going to go ahead and... Oh, tablet's freaking out a little bit. I haven't used my tablet in like three weeks, so it's yelling at me. Let me see something real fast. Is this a little bit better? That's a little bit better. Okay, let's get some teeth in here. So let's go Subtool, let's go Insert, and let's go a new sphere, and this will be our teeth. And really, we're gonna keep this pretty simple. So I'm just gonna come up here to the gizmo and we're gonna go up to extender. And I'm just going to not grab this, the cone I want. I'm gonna extend that out in a little bit. And then we're gonna go ahead and say accept. And then we're going to taper this down just a little bit. Just get some sort of base, nothing crazy. And then we're just gonna go ahead and dynamesh this. Let's start super low. I start. Let's start with 32. There we go. That's fine. Let's turn on symmetry. Let's do a little bit of a smooth. I'm going to increase the smooth just a little bit. And we'll start with that. I'm just reshape this thing. So let's go move. Big old brush. And we'll get something. And then I like to use the trim dynamic. So B, T, D. And we're just gonna start kind of giving it a little bit of a, of a flare. And let's adjust the intensity, it's a little bit much. You're from Bangladesh. What's up, Pixel? Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. What's up, man? I'm working uh, on myself, working on a character, and I'm watching your stream from Canada. Canada, dude, that's awesome, Black Cookie. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it, and welcome, welcome. Uh, let's see here. Um, when I did some sculpting in Dynamesh after I want to do the details, I press zebra measure and all, all sculpting kind of changes. All the, oh, the sculpting itself kind of changes. Yeah, so when you go from Dynamesh to zebra measure, you're changing the entire topology as a whole. Um, I could show you how to get all that detail back so you don't feel like you gotta re-sculpt everything. It's as simple as just projecting the details back onto your model. 
And there is, um, the old way would be to duplicate your mesh and then project it down from one subtool to another. Um, but I'd say about three, four years ago, they introduced project from history and that makes it a lot easier now. So I'll show you that method here in a second. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do, for the teeth, I like the teeth to have just a little bit of a hard edge so that it catches the highlights correctly. So then it, you notice more of the tooth. The tooth should feel a little bit more than just a cylindrical shape. It's, does, it needs to be kind of sharp and harsh. If you look at your teeth in the mirror, although our teeth aren't like, shaped like this, they're a little bit more flat. And, but they have, they have plane changes to them and that plane change really does make a difference. So taking the same idea, giving this tooth some plane changes will really just kind of help out. And it'll just kind of help the support a little bit. Also a little bit of texture never hurt anyone. So, all right, here's a rough tooth. And he has like, on tip, on common, he has like four showing typically so what i'm going to do i'm going to scale this all the way down in fact before we do that let me show you the dynamesh here so check this out so we're going to exaggerate this just a bit so let's say i have some higher resolution detail there we go and now i'm going to start carving in some actually let's use rake rake brush is fun let's do a lower intensity and a higher resolution so this will be a little bit more of a simplified approach. But give our teeth a little bit of texture, right? Smooth that down just a little bit, okay. Now, let's say I want to turn around, right? And I want to actually keep a lot of this, this, this little funky detail, these little micro details. This is super helpful, right? So the way to do this would be to go ahead and just say, first off, let's see remesh it. Right? So we're gonna come here and we're gonna Z remesh. So I'm gonna do this a little out of out of um, a little out of order, but I'll show you why. So I'm gonna go ahead and say target polys count five, that's common, adapt, turned on. I leave that turned on, but immediately go to adaptive size and turn that down to zero. And then I do keep groups and I turn that down to zero. Reason why is because when you do a keep groups with with smooth groups turned on, what you're gonna get is all the normals are gonna smooth and round. And it's gonna appear as if it's quote shrinking. It's not shrinking, it's just smoothing. But then sometimes the projection won't be correct. So what I'm gonna do is take the smooth groups, even though I have one poly group, I'm gonna turn that down to zero and it gives me a little bit more control. And then we're gonna go ahead and say zero mesh, boop. And of course, this is what we got. So we had our Dynamesh, now we have this. I'm gonna say half, and I'm gonna take this down by like a lot. There you go. Maybe more than that. Boom. So now each tooth is only 145 total points. So super low, right? And now what I wanna do is get that detail back. Well, the reason why you zero mesh is for subdivision. So I'm going to divide up a couple times by hitting Control D. And I'm gonna divide, say maybe subdivision level five. And then I wanna project. Now, the old way of doing it, like I said, was to project by duplicating the previous mesh and then zero meshing it. But what we could do is we can go back in history or you could plan, you could plan for this ahead of time. You come right up here to our nice, little, uh, our nice little history bar, press and hold control and tap and put a history marker there. This history marker, is now gonna remember the current state of this mesh. And so you can go back as far as you would like. And then once now we've come here, I can come through, go to Subtool, and I could say, let's project and project history. And now there's all of that information back. So now if we go back in time, boop, it looks like this. So this was the Dynamesh version. So I'm gonna stamp that over and now let's go forward in history. And now this is the subdivided version. And you can see here, I got all that detail back. So it's a really great way to do that. And then two, because now I have some, you know, I have my subdivisions, I have a lot more control, and I can even like cut this for UVs in the future. So now that we have that, what's also fun is I wanna duplicate this tooth. So I'm actually gonna come through here. I'm gonna scale this down and we're going to angle this. 
Now we're going to put the tooth in somewhat of a good spot. Now, of course, these teeth are typically small, right? And I want a couple of his fangs kind of overlapping a bit. Yep, we're giving him fangs. So I'm gonna kind of do something like this. I'm actually gonna delete lower because I want to duplicate it to the other side, but keep it on the same subtool. So I've taken my my uh, my subdivision level five and deleted lower. I'm now going to go to geometry, modify topology, and I'm gonna mirror and weld that. So it's gonna give me this. And then I'm gonna reconstruct those subdivisions. Now I have my subdivisions back with the details I have on each tooth, but now I have one on each side and I can easily now adjust these as I want. And of course too, again, if I delete lower and let's actually come here, give him a couple more. Let's actually put these over here, maybe angle these up a little bit. Say something like this. Again, coming back, I can reconstruct those subdivisions and now I didn't lose anything and I have duplicates of the other one. So really fun, really simple, really great way to keep all that going. In fact, what I'm gonna do now is duplicate one more. Let's rotate this around. Now, if you notice, if things are a little, like it's, I'm noticing that ZBrush is a little, it's a little laggy right now. I'm like, why is ZBrush a little laggy? Well, I have subdivisions and dynamic subdivision turned on. That's not good. So I need to turn off dynamic subdivision so that it moves a little bit because now it's just pulling too many resources. And we're actually gonna go ahead and do something like that. So we're gonna give him total of this. Let's reconstruct. Now I got my subdivisions and I have my different teeth and now we can start working from this. And before actually I do the reconstruct subdivisions on that, what I'm going to do real fast is go to polygroups, auto groups, and then have each tooth have its own polygroup. And then if I wanted to, I can mirror and weld, keeping the polygroups together so I can keep these tied to each other, and then I can reconstruct. So really helpful way to keep those subdivisions without feeling like you gotta rework a bunch. Oh, sure. If you downloaded the anime base mesh for my Discord, awesome, man. Awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff there. Did I share that link, by the way? I feel like I blanked on that. Let me do that one more time. So the concept is actually just from the original cartoon show. So I'm just literally looking at this concept and then just kind of making my own from it. So seeing all the different ways he was posed in the 1987 TV series, uh, yeah, I'm just literally just going through it on that. I like to make things, when I do fan art, I think it's important to kind of make it your own, kind of do your own thing, but reference and make sure you get all the cool originals stuff in there as well. It's kind of like caricatures. When you're doing a caricature of somebody, you're taking all the important parts that make that person what that person is, but then you're just exaggerating or you're doing your own kind of flavor to it. It's the same idea, so I'm not just straight copying. If I had a concept for like, if they, if, if they hired me and said, hey, go do this concept, and they handed me a concept, then I would match 100%. But since this is just a nice little fan art piece, I'm just kind of doing my own thing. Okay, so I'm gonna pull this tooth out. There we go. Give him something like that. Mask that off, there we go. Perfect, get that here. And then kind of move this forward. Just a little bit. And now what's fun is, so like, we wanna make this so it feels a little bit more realistic. I like to make my stuff feel more realistic. So I'm gonna move this tooth out just a little bit. I'm also going to inflate this one by pressing and holding control and giving it a little bit of an inflate. Just make it a little bit thicker. And then we're gonna come here. Now we're now gonna move the mouth around to fit the needs. Let me just check questions real quick. I wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, let's see, do, 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 do. Um, holy hell, I'm also working with toys. How did I guess I like, can you be contracted for networking? Contacted for network person. Hit me, hit me up on uh, my socials, the, the Discord I just shared. Hit me up on there. And yeah, we can absolutely uh, chat. So I currently right now work at Maxon. I'm the lead Zebras trainer and training manager, um, but I still from time to time will do some fun stuff with toys. I used to work at Funko. Funko was an amazing place, did a lot of fun pops and uh, worked on um, their digital pop line as well. 
and I was there for almost two years. Great team, great company. It was super fun. Let's see. You're here in Brazil. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, when I'm trying to split mass points... Sorry, hold on. When I was trying to split mass points from the anime-based mesh... Uh, uh, I have a difficult time doing that. What am I missing? When you're trying to split mass points from the anime base from your Discord, you're having a difficult time doing so. What are you missing? Okay, um, mass point. Okay, so you're trying to split off. Well, the uh, I, I haven't opened that anime Discord that anime base mesh in a couple days. Um, here, one second. Let me see if I can just download it real quick. That might be helpful. Where did I put it? Let's see here. Give me one second. So I'll see if I can help you out here. Nope, not that one. What channel did I throw that in? Was that community free tools? Probably. Yep, there it is. Okay. I need to update this one actually. I think I need to update that one. Okay, here, let's see. Well, let's pop over here. Let's load tool. Sorry, no, it's an uh, it's an OBJ. I somehow dropped the OBJ on that. There we go. All right, that's a fun one. So th this is the right one, right? This is the the one you you downloaded as well. This one is old. I really should update this. <laughs> okay, so you're trying to split. So you're you're masking, and then you need to go to uh, Subtool, Split, and Split Masked Points. And that will automatically split that off for you. Um, the reason why I have it like this, though, so the reason why I have it like this is is just so you can easily mask it off as quickly as possible. Um, so yeah, you can just quickly mask this stuff off if you needed to, um, and kind of break it up into sections. But yeah, that's how you would do it. If you want to ma split by mass points, that's all you need to do. You need to, what you can do is actually use the gizmo, pop the gizmo open and just, uh, you know, tap control shift on a poly group that you want to mask off. This will do a quick mass selection. And then from there, you can just say, come over to sub tool, split and split on mass points. Or you can say split mass points. It does the exact same thing, just the opposite way. So it'll still split off the mass points, but it'll keep the one that was unmasked and everything else that's masked gets split off into the ether on your next sub tool. So it's now here. Um, yeah, fun, fun stuff. Great question, by the way. Hopefully that answered that question. All right. Let's see, uh, you're an animation student. I love the sculpting process, but the uh, retopology phase always scares me a bit. Would you say a ZeroMesh project workflow is acceptable in the animation industry? That is a fantastic question and one that I know has a lot of really unique answers to it. So here's my opinion on that. It's up to your animation team. The animation team itself are going to be the guys who ultimately, they're going to be the people that ultimately decide what works and what doesn't. And if you just do a Z remesh and then hand it to them and it doesn't work, they go to rig it and it's failing, it's going to be really difficult for you to get uh, that piece through. They're just going to kick it back and you'll have to retopologize it. That being said, learning manual retopology is actually quite important because it's going to showcase to you the proper edge flows, uh, the edge loops and how they flow and how parts deform when they're in motion, which is why I highly recommend that even if you do not rig your character, even if you're just doing a T pose for game or animation, 
pose your character because then you'll see exactly how that mesh is deforming and you'll run into so many uh, you'll prevent so many problems by catching those problems early on. So it's imperative that you kind of understand the process. That being said, I do have a story and I'll actually show it to you. I'll show you the project. So we're just gonna go up to Art Station and we're gonna show you my portfolio. And I'm gonna tell you that I did this job a couple years ago for coach.com, which is super cool. And this is the uh, Rexy. This is the uh, stylized version of Rexy that they had used, and this was the animation mock-up. And this job took me a couple months to get it all the way through from start to finish. And I used ZBrush, then Substance Painter, and then eventually Marmoset Toolbag. And here was my test pose to bring life to the character, to really showcase what it is that they wanted to get. And then here is the Marmoset Toolbag preview. And if we go to the topology, here is the topology. Now you saw the animation. This is 100% ZBrush. Now, why am I telling you this? It's ZBrush because I they were like, I need to get this done quickly. So I went ahead and understood how edge flow should work. I understood how my model would deform, which is super important. I was doing some test posing and giving them a, a, a more high res detailed version. But ultimately I needed to know that this was going to work. So I sent this to the animation team and said, hey, here is my test mesh, confirm that this works. And if it does, I'll optimize as required. They turned around two days later and showed me this and said, hey, test complete, we loved it. Great job. Excellent. So it's all about communication. At the end of the day, you might get lucky and you might actually be able to zero mesh something and say, here you go, this deformed. But it's not in the best practice to do so without the team knowing. Talk to the team. Most game studios will have like somebody who helps like really build in the mesh. So then you'll have base meshes to work with. The animation team will have rules and what they want to see. Um, and depending on the team, like Pixar has different meshes than, you know, uh, than DreamWorks. Like everybody kind of does their own thing. Um, but it's, it's what's best for the animation team. And I cannot stress that enough. So yeah, talk to them. If you think you got something that can work, send it to them. And that's exactly what I did here. I said, I think this will work. Let me know what you think. They said, yeah, looks great. We loved it. Please just send us the textures and we're good to go. And I was like, cool. Cause all they had was just, well, I had, they had some textures, but they were just like, give us the high res stuff and then we'll, we'll push it through. And then we also did some 3D printing and got all this stuff made. So again, it's all about communication. Um, at the end of the day, manual retopology is super important. And I highly recommend that the way you should learn topology is go through the manual steps. And then once you understand how it all works, that is when you can start looking for shortcuts. Is this gonna be optimized the way it should be so that everything looks and feels the way the character needs to look? And that's really important. So, and if it's not optimized well, then things are gonna fall apart and then your product looks bad and then you get judged on that. And you don't want that. You wanna make sure that people love your work, that they are really into it and that it makes the most sense and visually is the best. So that's a very long winded answer and I really hope that's helpful, but you know, I think it's super important and it's a great question. I get asked that a lot and I usually go back to this model because of that. Yeah, exactly, Big Ham. Every animation team works differently. A thousand percent, I can't stress that enough. Yeah. Great question, by the way, super great question. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of direction. All right, let's kind of get some of this in here. Okay, so we have the basic shape. Now let's get the rest of this in. We need to have his seat in here and that's gonna help reshape a little bit of that as well. So um, actually before I do that, one thing I wanna do is I wanna add a little bit of blobbiness to, uh, to his arms here. Cause he has a little bit of that. They're not just pulled out tentacles. 
And if we're fighting the geometry a little bit, let's go to brush, auto masking, back face mask. This will help us make sure that we're not clipping or pushing the mesh too far. There we go. Yeah, smooth that down just a little bit. Okay, it was really fun on answer. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I have the tendency to ramble. <laughs> so, and I really like trying to drive a point home. Uh, my, 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 my fellow teammates get to hear it all the time. And I'm like, oh, sorry. I know you asked a simple question, <laughs> but I got a 20 minute answer for you. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's get the seed in. I started noodling again. All right. So here we go. So here's what we're going to do. So like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select the teeth, the body and the eyes. And I'm actually going to put this in a folder. Actually, here, let's do this. Let's make sure that I'm grabbing. Now this trick only works when you have, um, more than one sub tool and you're not, you know, and you're not putting everything in that sub tool. So, so we're gonna put him in the folder there. Perfect, turn off that pizza box. I'm gonna go ahead and insert and we're gonna get a cylinder and I'm going to kick the cylinder out of this folder and we're gonna call this chair, boom. Organization is key, so we'll call this the seat. All right. You want to know more about polygroups and what makes them important? Absolutely. Um, the easiest answer is polygroups is a controlled way as a selection set. Think of it as like a, a custom ID map, so to speak. So the, what makes them important is to be able to work on different sections of your mesh and protect the rest of it. So case in point, uh, this is actually not a good example. Case in point here, we have our character here. And let's say I want to now take the arms and make sure that the arms are nice and, you know, I can select them and just work on them and protect everything else. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to mask this area off, say something like this. I'm going to go ahead and sharpen that a little bit. Okay, and I'm gonna hit Control W. So what makes them super important, they have multiple features built inside. So even just two polygroups, I now know I can mask off the arms anytime by either doing that selection, hitting the gizmo and just Control Shift or Control Tapping the polygroup that does an automatic protection, which is really cool. The other aspect is actually utilizing it for zero meshing, UV unwrapping, and a little bit more than that. Like there are some other areas, I'm blanking on a couple other examples, but these are what the most people, including myself, will use them for. So say something like this, I can actually then polish these groups and I can work off of these selections anytime I want. Here, if I go to Z Remesh, I'm gonna go ahead and control tap this, um, come in and say, let me go ahead and Z Remesh this guy. So let's Z Remesh his head for a second, just to have a little bit of a cleaner mesh to work off of. So you will see here that now, look at this edge loop, boom. This poly group, because I had key groups turned on, this poly group, it recognized the different poly groups and it created a special custom edge loop that supports that separation and it kept that. So it's really helpful for me to now have this lower topology and I can work with that. Then I could subdivide a few times and then we can do what we did earlier by going to project and project history. And now I have this. It's also good, the other example I was thinking of was actually modeling. So like, let's take a seat for example. So I'm gonna come through here. I'm gonna go edge loop and delete loops because I'm working, I'm gonna build this as super low res as possible. Now I wanna be able to, let's just reshape this real fast. So I'm gonna drag this down. Oh, this song's pretty cool. I like this song. Hopefully you guys can hear it. So now I want to be able to work with my Z modeling brush, right? So I got my Z modeler. Now everything is the exact same group right now. So what happens if I want to extrude all of the same poly groups, right? I'm going to grab this. Boom. It's just going to grab everything. Well, 
let's actually come here to polygroups and let's group by normals. So let's say uh, every normal facing at 45 degree angle, give me a different polygroup. So I'm gonna say group by normals. Boop, now I have all these different polygroups. Now with that exact same setting, I wanna extrude all the polygroups, all these blue ones, that's gonna happen. And what's cool is if I tap Alt a bunch of times, I can actually pick and change the polygroup. And then I can repeat that same action by just tapping one time and it extrudes out again and again and again on that one polygroup. So it's giving me really good control over the selection set, which is again, what a polygroup pretty much is. And so it's a nice way. The other way too is, let's say I want to UV unwrap this. So there's a few new UV tools that you could do. Let's say I would go ahead and just delete our UV so we got nothing on here. Well, a quick, fast and dirty way of doing it is actually going to UV master, picking polygroups and just saying unwrap. So now if I flatten this, all right, it's that. I got a weird bump there. So let's turn that bump down, make this zero. Boom. So there's my there's my UVs based on those polygroups, right? Um, I could also, let's say I didn't want to do it that way. So let's delete that. And let's say I wanted to actually crease by polygroup. So I have this really nice edge. And let's actually go one more step. Let's go multiple groups, interactive, keep that group. I'm gonna drag this out, okay? And then if I were to soften this out, it's gonna kind of give me, actually let's do it the other way. Let's go in. Yeah, let's do it like this, okay. So now I'm gonna go ahead and hit D for dynamic and you're gonna see that this kind of rounds out. And maybe I want that to be tack sharp. So, I'm gonna go ahead now and say crease by my polygroup, so crease PGs. And now if I smooth that out, you notice it keeps that nice sharp edge because we now have a crease and it's respecting that crease. And it's because of the polygroups, I was able to do that so fast. So it's about being able to select your mesh and control your mesh exactly as you want. It's really good for repurposing and zero meshing and getting correct edge loops exactly where you want. It's really good for modification or UV unwrapping. And ultimately at the end of the day, it's just a great way to control the space of your mesh and how it's being utilized. So hopefully that helps you on that. But yeah, polygroups, just king, they are amazing. Hold on one second. Okay, I missed a few questions. I don't like missing questions. Hold on one second. Let's see, let's go back up just a little bit. I have a question about curved tube. Perhaps you know the answer. Maybe it's not possible to solve the brush stroke, but if you draw the curved tube over a flat surface, why does the curve twist along the length? I mean, the edge loop on top being, uh, at the beginning, it may not be at the top. I think there's an error in the construction of the brush. Oh, interesting. Uh, let's see here. So let's go curve tube real quick. Okay, so first off, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a quick common error check. See this curve tube and how it's like running around and doing stuff. It's actually picking up the other mesh on the history that I have called out way over here. So we need to clear that. So I'm gonna go ahead and just press control and tap in an empty space and get rid of that. So control tap adds a history and control tap deletes history. So you're asking why does it kind of twist around? So it's taking into account your brush stroke and how you're actually drawing that out. So if I were to do this, I'm gonna get some twisting for sure. It's picking up the very first point of contact. And now notice that it's picking, ZBrush works off of vertices. That's how ZBrush works. Every vertice is a point of contact and that point of contact is what's determining that brush stroke. So as I draw this out and I coming through here, it's going to notify that. So if you have, let's say a point over here and then I do this, well, it's gonna to try to twist from that point and respect to your stroke as much as possible. So on a super low mesh, you're actually not gonna notice this so much, but as your topology gets higher, you're definitely going to notice that. The other thing too is knowing how the stroke system is operating. So there is a very fun menu called Picker, and it's really small, and nine times out of 10, it gets overlooked by most ZBrush users, but the Picker actually has a nice depth function to it. And this is how the majority of the brushes function. And here you'll see it says the top left, once Z, continuous Z, 
closest Z, furthest Z. And what that means is basically it's going to pick up the one time on the mesh closest on the Z axis, and then it's going to, whatever that point of contact is, it's going to ignore everything else and just refer to that one point. If I were to do closest Z and I drag, it's going to find the closest point to the Z axis as possible, and then it's going to work off of that. If I do continuous Z, now this one's super fun, as I drag this out, it's going to respect every vertice it runs into, giving you a much different result. Even if I were to do this, it's now focusing on paying attention and looking at the surface of that mesh. If I were to do furthest come through, it's gonna to try to find the furthest. Now this is super low res, so you're not seeing a whole lot of differences, um, but this is how these brush system works. And the curve two brushes are set to one time only. So if I pull from over here, turn around, let's say we just do this real quick, you might actually start seeing that there could be a little bit of twisting. Um, so to control this, Really, you just gotta control where the stroke is. I like to use continuous on most of my brushes. I think it really helps the most, but you're not going to be able to prevent too much twisting too often. Now, what's really fun is the fact that we actually have some other tools to help us with this. So one of the fun ways about doing, if we want something perfectly straight, but we wanna then modify that twist, we can actually go up to stroke, we can go up to our curve function and say, add as line. But there are other things to take a look at here. We have repel fall off, which is a new feature as of uh, 2021, I think. Maybe this was added. This was added around the same time they added the alpha, um, the alpha hairbrush. So we have uh, repel fall off and repel strength. This is also going to affect how the mesh is being drawn out. Before it had like a little bit of a well repel. It had if I come into stroke and say repel at what was that point two I think or was it two? Was it two? So if I do this and I start dragging this down, it's going to try to repel off this edge. Now I've changed. Let's go back to one C. Again, we'll draw this off, and it's kind of it's trying, well, it's actually doing a, yeah, it's just kind of just trying to fall straight off on that. But you can you can adjust this a little bit further if you want. Oh, repel strings at zero. So let's kick repel back up here. And now you can see if I draw this, it's gonna have a little bit of an arch to it. Well, if we want to make something perfectly straight, what we can do is just turn all the repel function off and say as line. And then what I can do is I can drag this and this will be a straight line. And then from here, I can then modify this. I can separate this out. So I can say, you know, let's go ahead and just, let's just go ahead and split unmasked. Kind of going on a rant here. There we go, split unmasked. And then from here, right, I can actually do some other cool features like maybe bend curve. And then we can do some adjustments with bend curve. Let's actually go off of this point here, bend curve. Right, and then we can add some bending, but we can also twist and rotate our mesh as well with these different cones. So you can really have a little bit more control, which is how I like to use bend curve a little bit. But if you wanna just use the curve system itself, then going back to this guy right here, again, it's all about just adjusting and just playing with the strokes and figuring out what that, what that function does in general. Um, so play with that, that should help. The other thing too, is that if you really want something to wrap around an edge loop really easily, um, is that you go to your curve functions and you can actually use frame mesh. This will help you keep things wrapping around really nicely. So if I wanted to, I could say, let's actually do polygroups, frame that mesh, tap one time and just get a nice, there we go. And it'll just wrap around really nicely. The thing is that the curves, the curves have the ability to, let's go to stroke one second. The curve has the ability to be manipulated. So it's trying its best to figure out exactly what it is you're asking of it and how you can continue that, that drawing out process. But at any point in time, you can come through and start manipulating and dragging this out and moving that however you want. It's giving me a little weird reaction here. So, but there we go, ultimately. And then we can adjust this too. We can actually come up here and say, you know what, let's, let's lock our start. We can have lock start and lock end. So then, you know, it's gonna keep those positions always intact. 
or we can say let's lock the end process but the start should happen as well i've kind of messed this thing up now i've kind of gone all over the place at this point but hopefully that was helpful um yeah it's it's a little interesting the way it can work for sure but it's fun hey what's up tattoon how you doing how you doing Let's see here. Hold on. Uh, my dream is to work for Mattel. I'm wondering what should be in my portfolio and what not to have. Um, so easy, e easiest thing to do. If you want to work for Mattel, learn keying, learn articulation, learn 3D printing and showcase that your models can be 3D printed um, and have a good breakdown of your model. Showcase how many keys, learn, like really study articulation. Uh, best thing to do is go buy some toys that Mattel produces, take them home, take them apart and kind of look at them and try to replicate that in your models and just learn from that. Um, you're kind of catering to Mattel, so at that point you really just want to, you really want to know that you're hitting the, the marker. Um, and so, yeah, have something that represents what they do in your portfolio, but the ability to make a model and then make it manufacturingable, 3D printing is a really good tool for that. It'll show that your models can be produced in real world because ultimately that's what you're designing for and that will at least gather their attention um, and then you just always hit them up you know hit any company up and just send in your portfolio and ask questions and apply to jobs and just go through that um, if you want to take a look um, at my portfolio if it's any of any help to you um, it's gotten me work so I think it's I don't think it's too terrible <laughs> but yeah so um, definitely go through you could take a look at that and kind of replicate something similar to it i think the biggest thing to do is that like you know when you make something that is you know for 3d printing what's a good example i have here so like this chung lee versus vega fan art statue showcased all the model what it was um, all the colored versions i also i think i rendered a lot here and then I also did clay. Clay renders are a great way to showcase that you're not hiding anything. Uh, believe it or not, color can hide a lot of information and you'd be surprised how, uh, how often that is. So showcase the uh, clay rendered version of it. It's helpful. And then show that you can 3D print it. This is a big step. Showing that you can 3D print it is something that will ultimately just allow the the toy company or whoever you're talking to being like, yeah, this person understands that th this has to go through a production process. Um, a lot of toy companies, especially on the higher end, they usually have someone who or have a team dedicated to the, the keying process, but there are jobs that you could get that is just keying and articulation. So uh, depending on where you want to be, if you want to do the main sculptures, understand the process, sometimes they'll ask you to do it, but then again, some companies might have that. So kind of learn more about the company and kind of cater to them a little bit. That's always helpful. Let's see here. Uh, make it, trying to make sure I'm not missing anything. Got a lot of great questions today, so super cool. Uh, question about printing. How do you usually hollow your models? I typically hollow my models. Um, I actually typically do it in the 3D printing slicer. They've gotten really good, guys. Like, Lychee Slicer is one of my favorite. Uh, Tamar Roussel is the creator and founder of Lychee Slicer. And yeah, it's it's amazing. His The hollowing algorithm on there is actually pretty good. So I actually tend to do that just because it's a little bit more controllable for me and it guarantees. I can also make sure that if my model comes in that's not watertight, I can correct any imperfections. So in 3D printing, it needs to be solid, correct? Uh, okay, if, it, if the ends are closed off the bottoms, the make mouse legs connected, what would this apply? Yeah, so for 3D printing, it needs to be what's called watertight. It needs to be solid where there's no holes in the mesh. Um, even if it's shelled, if the model is shelled, the shell itself, the thickness, has to be watertight, which is typically why I will do that in a slicer. You could do that in ZBrush. It's just a few more steps, and it's not impossible. It's just I like the control that Leechy does for that. 
But what's cool about ZBrush is we have a shelling DynaMesh function that allows you to do that, that function inside of ZBrush. And then we have the ability to come up here to transform and analyze our mesh and actually see these keywords watertight. That's super important. And that watertight functionality is gonna tell me whether or not it could be printed or not. If there was a hole in it, then I couldn't do that. So that's the thing. DynaMesh is really good here. DynaMesh's job is to uh, basically close all holes, delete the internal mesh, making the mesh solid and watertight. DynaMesh is really good for that. We use it a lot in the toy world. So anytime I do something that's gonna be for 3D printing or manufacture, I use DynaMesh nine times out of 10. I'll also use um, geometry, modified topology, and I'll use weld points and close holes as well. Um, and sometimes if, if ZBrush detects it's not watertight, but you're like, no, this mesh has been solid, then you could have floating bits of geometry you're just not seeing, and then you can correct that by doing auto group, selecting the main mesh, and then seeing if they're floating bits. If there are, delete them, and then you're good to go. So yeah, watertight is the key correct term. <laughs> not a problem, not a problem. Yes, uh, I think hollow do your, uh, do make your thing less durable. It depends on your item. Yeah, hollowing, uh, hollowing you wanna make sure that the, the depending on, the, on what you're doing, you wanna make sure that things are as, um, you know, as controllable as possible. Yeah, you wanna make sure that uh, that it's thick enough to withstand uh, child, child abusing the toy. Okay, so here we're gonna do something a little bit fun. I'm gonna show you guys something. I've been on this kick for a long time because at the summit we had a, a feature come out that was really cool in that, oh, it, no, sorry, we didn't have a feature that came out. We had a feature that was showcased uh, called Fe uh, Mesh Fusion. And a lot of people, it broke the internet and everybody was super excited about it. And so um, I always, I've been showing it off lately and just because it's been a lot of fun. Um, but I'll share these, these free brushes. Um, they're called Mesh Fusion Retopo. Uh, it's by Henry Shervenka, super awesome dude. In fact, I'm gonna share the link so you guys can get the same brush too. This is one of my favorite uh, artist brushes. I've used this brush quite a lot and I love to scream it from the rooftops because it's such a cool thing. So not that one, text, there we go, there it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the link to this and I'll show you how it works. It's pretty simple, fast, fun, and unique. Basically what it is is this mesh right here has 32 edge loops. I just know because that's the standard for ZBrush. So grab this 32. I'm gonna go ahead and drag this out so it does this. Control drag, control drag, rebuilds that topology on the fly. And this is also another way why polygroups are so cool is that you get to rebuild that topology based on those polygroups. And that's how it works. You just get to drag that out, control drag, control drag. As long as there's no subdivisions and you have polygroups, that's key, you have to have polygroups, no subdivisions. You can rebuild this really quick, fast, and in a hurry. So super fun, been really loving that. I'm gonna go ahead and drag this on here. Now we're gonna go ahead and grab an IMM primitive sphere, and I'm gonna drag this out because he has a kind of spherical bottom to this. So I'm actually, what I'm gonna do here, I'm going to boop, come in and delete hidden. And here, actually, before we do that, I'm gonna go ahead and grab my Z remesher tool. I'm gonna to come in and I'm gonna say, let's close holes. Boom, not concave, but convex. Should give me something like this, which is really nice. Now I'm actually going to select that, bring that up here for a second. I'm gonna grab this and I'm gonna be going to polygroups and group by normals. Grab that same brush. Nope, it's, nope. I'm hitting things. What are you hitting, Ian? Grab that guy right there, drag this out. Again, you can just kind of position that just to be a little bit closer. Boom, boom, boom. So just a nice 
mask that off. There we go. And we'll get this kind of shaped in here. I'm actually going to round this off just a little bit. Do something like this. So I actually want these to be separate pieces at the moment. I try to block out that way. I try to block out with separate shapes in mind. And let's do something like that. This is a really slow song. I don't like this song. Let's boop. Need something a little bit of brass pace. Nice fastener pack in that in that link. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Do do do. You're gonna work. Well, can I work with reference mesh inside ZBrush? Can you work with a reference mesh inside of ZBrush? Yeah, absolutely, 100%, yeah. If you have reference mesh, something you've brought in to ZBrush specifically, and you need to always have that on the side, you could just go Shift S, and that's gonna stamp it, and it's 2.5D, it's gonna stamp a image of that. And so then from there, I can actually just always have that on the side when I need it, pardon me. Um, you could just always kind of have that on the side, no problem, and that's, that's the easiest way to go about doing that. And then to clear that, Control N will do that. So again, you can just, and no, it's fun. You can actually stamp it like this. You can do multiple ones, Shift S, Shift S. So you can have something like that. And then that way, also too, what's fun is let's say we go to V2 and we hide everything else except for the seat. I only want to work on the seat right now. So now I can work on the seat. And then this will show me all of this fun stuff as well. There's also, if we clear this out too. So let's just grab this guy. Let's go back to V1. This so shows everything. So the other thing we can do as well is that if you're if you want to reference your current mesh, but you're working on one piece in general, so you could actually go to transform and split screen. And this will do this function for you. So split screen will allow you to work on the right hand side of your screen by and still showcasing the left side so you can still see your whole model um, but the thing to remember is that as i'm working it's going to zoom in and out as well and it's going to pan so it's it's going to respect it's as if it's all active at the same time like in single single mode but it's only showcasing the one i'm currently active so it's like an advanced solo mode on that point and then to turn that off. And you also can do split screen like this, where you can have the top one, so you can have it in a different way. There's a few different modes. Um, and then you could just turn that off. I like the stamp function a lot. I think the stamp function is really cool, because again, it allows me to kind of just get here, stamp that, showcase that, and then I can just hit solo, and I can just focus on this. So. And then here, I'm just going to go to polygroups and auto groups, and we're just going to just play with this a little bit more. So a few different ways you can do that. So that's the reference mesh on that. Hey, Mr. White, what's going on? And I have a question about my 3D prints. My final outcome is very rough. I can see lines. Unlike models which are uh, out there, which are smooth, uh, may I know it is because of the material I picked or the services is, is bad. Oh, Andrew. Well, okay. So it sounds like you did you pick FDM printing or resin printing? So resin is naturally smoother than FDM just because of it's it's a liquid that then is cured with UV resin with UV lighting, which then turns around and gives you a solid result. It still is using layer lines, but the it's actually at a much higher resolution. Usually it starts at around 50 microns. Um, and that's really small, like that's small. Um, a lot of resin printers can comfortably go up to about 20 microns. I've seen some go up as, as high as five or 10. That's really fine. Uh, you would not see the layer line with the naked eye at that point. Um, with FDM, it's naturally built on layer lines and you're talking about 0.2 millimeter average thickness per line. So you're gonna see that. So if it's filament, then there are techniques out there like uh, PLA glue, smoothing, and stuff like that that's functional. You could do a lot of that. Um, however, 
yeah, I would say ultimately um, the main difference is that if you're doing FDM, unless you spend hours and hours and hours and oh, scratch that, if you spend days and days <laughs> of, of printing one piece at a super fine detail, like let's say 50 micron for resin printing, I mean for FDM printing, um, then yeah, you, you might not see lines, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a whole process. So first off, what type did you do? And then second off, if it is FDM, you're not going to get away from layer lines that well. You're just not going to. It's a little impossible. Um, it takes a lot. I've done some really great prints with FDM that are super smooth like butter, and you can barely see the layer lines, but it was printing for so long. Um, even something super small like, you know, let's say something like this guy. This is a Matthew Keene print. Shout out to Matthew Keene. Thanks, buddy, for this. This is super cool. This is his little dino, gamer dino that I use for this guy. Even something like this. This was done in, in, in resin, um, but the FDM, super fine detail, like 50 micron detail FDM printing, this would have taken anywhere between, you know, 12 to 20 hours to get that resolution, and it still would probably have done uh, failures without uh, a lot of supports. What's cool about resin is that I was actually to print this with next to no supports. There was almost no supports on this whatsoever because of the way I angled it, the resin actually had, does a lot better job at allowing you to get that fine detail without a ton of support. So this was near supportless. I think I might have had just a couple on these base teeth, but ultimately really, really good job. So yeah, so it, that's, that's a lot of it. Um, so it, it, and then two, there are tricks in how you set up your piece. Typically, you could set up your piece at like a 45 degree angle. Um, that's like an ideal 30 to 50 degree angle off the bed, off the build plate is typically a good place to start. Not guaranteed, but it is something that makes uh, makes it a lot easier. So, those are a little. Those are things that you could do as well. So hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> All right. So now we're gonna do we're gonna do some some fun array mesh stuff here. Real quick, I'm going to going to center a lot of this. So here I'm going to put this in the center. Here I'm gonna actually instead of just doing that, I don't need to center him that way. I'm just going to manually move him like that. Okay. I don't need him to be truly center, but I need this to be truly center because I'm going to be using a ray mesh for this and I want it to be as center as possible. All right, let's make sure I didn't hit, I miss any other questions. Let's see. Guys, there's tons of questions today. I love it. You guys are doing awesome. Um, is there a way to measure the area of a current selection, subtool, polygroup, et cetera? Says CDW. Absolutely, 100% there is. Let's actually do it now. Uh, so measuring. So measuring is actually really simple. Um, so first things first, we gotta come up to Z plugin and we need to go to scale master. This is the fastest way. We need to set a scale. You can measure in units without having a scale, but that information is, is well, it's it's lacking substance, right? Like you need to know: Are you working in millimeters, inches, feet? Like the in, what? If you're working imperial or a metric, whatever system you're you're used to, it's good to identify that. Because right now, um, I don't think I actually set a measurement. I might have when I done transform, but typically. Uh, ZBrush is usually defaulted in millimeters, so even if it says units at the top, it's really referring to millimeters. But what you can do is turn on your gizmo and then hit Y. So W for gizmo, then Y gives you the transpose line. And then what you can do is point to point. So I can grab this point, start dragging this out. I can press and hold shift to guarantee it's a straight line and it's gonna snap from one vertice to another. And then at the very top here, it's gonna call out a measurement. 0.306 units. So we haven't set scale yet on what this means. So to ZBrush, this is just its unit factor, which is usually defaulted somewhere in millimeters. But let's let's actually solidify that. So let's go to set scene scale. And this is, when you set scene scale, depending on the subtool you're on, it's going to pick the subtool that you have. So there are some tricks I do to this where I usually do a set scene scale to a cube, but in this case, um, we're just doing it to the cylinder. The reason why I do it for the cube is that a cube, six sides, it is 
even on all those sides, and therefore I can get an accurate measurement on that. I can also utilize that. So actually, let's do that. Let's show you why I do this. So I'm gonna go ahead and insert a cube. Boom, say something like this. I'm gonna go ahead and save this real quick, by the way. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, let's initialize this cube to just be a Q cube. And actually, let's just go two, two, two. Okay, so let's just default Q cube. Here it is, there's my cube, okay? And it's in his brain, perfect. So I'm gonna say set scene scale. And this is the measurement currently, 0.4 millimeters or 0.016 inches or 0.001 feet or 0.04 centimeters. So whatever you're working with, I'm gonna pick millimeters. Most 3D printing is living in millimeter. And then from here now that I know the size of the cube, I can measure that. So I can turn on W for gizmo, Y for transpose. And I could say, okay, from this point to this center point, that is 0.2 millimeter, which is usually the typical height of the FDM <laughs> that we're printing we were talking about. Now, what I like to do is again, we have six sides to our cube. We can now use this information and let's set our scale of this cube to be something tangible. And in this case, I'm gonna say 25.4 millimeters, which is equivalent to one inch if you're using the Imperial system. And now I'm gonna say, let's go ahead and resize our subtool. Now, if you get this error message, I say error, it's just resizing all subtools because it's based on the values of, it's larger than 100. What this is referring to is there is a spot in geometry under size in which it'll tell you the size of it. And in this case, it's trying to reset. Wherever it was currently at, it's saying things are a little bit big and it needs to re reshape some stuff to match the dimensions that you're giving it. So we're actually calling out real scale now. So I say, that's fine, don't worry about it. Just go ahead and say, okay. And it's gonna do its thing, it's gonna resize everything. Now let's measure that, right? So I'm gonna hit W, get that transpose line back. From this point to this point, we should see at the top here, 25.3987. So you get four decimal places. That's, you know, that's close enough. Boom, there you go. So right there, that's about, that's about an inch. That'll give you those measurements. And then what's cool about this is when you do this, so let's turn this back on, notice these little ticks. Right, so these little ticks are actually telling you that's that's the section. So you can then kind of figure that, well, this is 25.4, how many ticks across do I have? You can start doing some fun math for that. Typically right now what I do is I'll just, you know, maybe I need to measure from this point to this point and figure out that that's 17.9. So you can actually measure to the fourth decimal. Uh, for those who don't know, in inches, the fourth decimal place is tinier than a human hair. So you can measure quite, quite in-depthly in ZBrush. So that's how you would go through and, and do your measurements. So now, with something like this, if I need to measure, you know, crane here, what do I do? I just come up here, I grab this tool here, I'm gonna grab the lowest vertice, so I say this guy here, I'm gonna go ahead and, well, what's half of him? What's up to this point right here? So that right there is 47.7, 47.47 millimeters, right? Um, so if I do that again, grab that vertice, come all the way up in total height. I'm gonna eyeball that for a second. It's about 108.5-ish millimeters, give or take a couple decimal spots. So 108.4. So this will give you a really good idea of how something is. You want an accurate measurement of this one? Just come over here and say set scene scale and it'll tell you. Now that it knows it's in defaulted millimeters, it's gonna tell me that it's actually 137.49. And the where that's measuring, why that number was so different between here and here, is it's accounting this spot here. So it's measuring the overall value of it. So if I wanna know, well, how, how long is his arm? So right about there, uh, 76.8139 millimeters. So that's where that's at. Across from arm to arm, is 122.55 millimeters. So I can get close enough measurements to, to figure out what I want, and that's 106. So that's how you would measure in ZBrush, which is super helpful. What you could also do is you could go here to your uh, scale master, and then towards the bottom, you could say new bounding box. And if I click this, it's going to bound everything 
that is in my scene. So it's bounding a box to the height, width, and depth of every subtool in my scene. And then I can actually from here do a little cheaty cheat cheat. I can divide without smoothing a bunch of times. And then I can get some cues. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's eight. Let's divide one more. Okay, so now I can get some measurements. And then from here I could say, okay, let's let's do some accurate ones. So now we're not guessing. So from the top of his head to uh, the, you know, to somewhere around here. 144. So it just gives you a little bit more of an idea. So a, a very useful way of going about all of that. So, and then usually what I do is I will name this cube, uh, you know, 20, 25.4 millimeter. I'll name that. It says 25, but I'll name this. I'll say, you know what, this is uh, one inch or 24 millimeter. And then this will, now I have this identifying marker every time I go to set scene scale. If I reopen my project, I just say set scene scale on that inch and brings everything back to that measurement. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that real quick. Let's check the chat real fast. And then we need to, we need to still build some links. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, Great questions, guys, great questions. Um, let's see here. Nice, nice, okay. Hold on, Sebastian, I'm seeing your question, but I'm thinking that's, is, is your question a part? I might have missed you earlier. Let me scroll up for a bit just to make sure see your comments here. I mean, if you make several teeth from one, if you see, if change the matrix, change the others. If I change one, does it change the others? Um, there is actually a new feature that can do just that. It can actually change a lot of that. Um, yeah, let me check real quick. But no, if I change one tooth, it doesn't just uh, oh, wait, hold on. I think I know your question. Sorry. I think I understand your question. You're talking about this. If I do this, um, first off, I don't need, I can't have subdivisions, but if I change this one, it will change all of those together. I think I understood your question now. If I mask this one off and then come through and then do that, it's only going to change the one because everything else is masked and supported. So if you, if you do this, which I believe that's what you're asking, so hopefully this is correct, um, it's going to change everything. However, and... Let me see real fast. We have a new feature called repeat similar. So I'm gonna clear that real quick. And then uh, let's, okay, let's see if I remember how to do this. Uh, it's been a couple days. So um, I'm gonna come through here. I'm going to then change this one to say this. And then if I, and then if I apply similar, is that it? Oh my goodness. I forgot how to, did I forget how to do this? This is a new feature. I haven't played with it as much as I would like. So, so do forgive. Let me see here. If I mask this off, okay. I think what I need to do is actually make a, a history. So here, let's do this. Let's make, let's make history. Let's make history. Switch that over. And then if I were to change this guy right here, clear this out. It's thinking. Welcome to where Ian breaks everything stream. <laughs> uh, ZBrush, is, ZBrush is thinking. What did I do wrong? Okay. It did a thing. Okay. It did a thing. Uh, let's try that again. That felt weird. I do that, I come through here. Let's see what it does. Some topology only. It's... It's thinking again. It's taking longer than expected, to be honest with you. 
So you know what I'll do is I'll research this feature a little bit more. It's new. It's new to 2024, and I've only played with it a couple times. So there we go. So that's how you would do it. Yeah. So um, so basically, what you need to do is come through here. You need to basically let's clear that out. Okay. So let's just clear all that. Okay. Great. So you can't have subdivisions on this. You need to add a history marker, something for it to identify um, what things were. And we're going to go ahead and mask that out. And we're going to switch this to this sphere right here. We're going to clear that. Now I have topology only, but if I were to say apply this to similar, it should use that, that history to then identify all the parts within and the change. And then it's going to make that change you know, make that change for you. Um, it's taking a lot longer than I anticipated, but I could just have a little bit denser mesh than, than maybe it's liking at this moment. I'm not sure, but there you go. So then now it changed everything. So if you have like, uh, you know, if you have rivets all the way across a, a ship, or if you have, you know, teeth that you want to change from one tooth to another, if you got like a custom toothbrush, then you could definitely go about that. So that's, that's how you would change everything. So hopefully that was helpful. So there are ways, but yeah, if you were to do this, then it's gonna switch and then it's just gonna change all the other stuff out. Oh, your internet cut 10 minutes ago, Horizon, no. But to answer your question, do I have any recommendation 3D printers for beginners? Uh, Anycubic is great, Elogu Mars is really good. Um, for resin, um, any cubic, uh, I, um, I have an Ender 3. That's a little bit older of a machine. I think they're on Ender 5 now for the Corality. But um, Perugia is really good for, for FDM as well. I think there's a new Bamboo machine. I think any cubic has an FDM. Pretty much for like 200 bucks USD, you can find a really solid machine, um, no problem. I do recommend, though, everyone start with... Um, that everyone start with uh, uh, blanked. <laughs> Everybody start with FDM and not resin because you learn a lot about the manufacturing process, the prep process, and the time it takes to actually make something. And typically you can get a big FDM printer for a lot cheaper than you can get a big resin printer. And FDM PLA is relatively safe to use in a well ventilated area. So you want to make sure that you, you know, you have it in a space that is like, you know, away from everybody, but it's just nice and safe. Um, and that's helpful. So you can usually get nice big prints for pretty cheap. Filaments is also not very expensive, but it really teaches you a lot through the process. So um, that's, that's my recommendation. Okay, um, let me move forward with this just a little bit because I don't want to get too, too far. We still have like time. I'm going until one o'clock. New time, by the way, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. So we streaming for three hours, peeps. So we're doing it. Okay, so let's do this real quick. So we're gonna come through here and we're actually gonna use array mesh. This is one of my favorite features in the whole wide world. It's really, really cool. Um, and the reason why it's so cool is because we get to do some fun stuff. We get to do stuff like this. Let's turn array mesh on, transpose, and we're gonna lock position. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna repeat. We have a tripod for his chair. And so that is what we're going to be utilizing. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to rotate on the Y axis 360 degrees, which is super fun. And then from there, what's neat is then I'm gonna pull this back, boom. And now this allows me to position this exactly as I see fit. And of course, if this feels a little off center to us, we can actually change the quote lock position and move this forward to be a little bit more center, relock that position so everything can be identified as necessary. So we can change that, that's gonna be pretty good. Say something like that. And these are also super thick legs, so we're gonna make this a little bit skinnier. Here we go. Now the fun part is that we don't try to get everything perfect in the first shot. If you happen to, that's always great. But 
I typically try not to. I just try to get it close enough for what I'm going for. I can always make adjustments later. I'm gonna shrink this down just a little bit. There we go. Okay, that should be good. And then here, we're just gonna make this our proper mesh. It's the quickest way to get legs. Also, what we can do before we make the mesh, that's actually, so I was doing a uh, inflate shrink. So I was making it skinny by pressing, holding control and using the scale of the gizmo. But you can see here that's caused some warpage. So I'm gonna use the clip curve at a hundred percent. And I'm just gonna clip just above this edge, which will re-flatten that out. So again, control shift, come through here clip that, same thing this way, I'm gonna come through and clip this. And because array mesh is just repeating that process, so let's say something like that, there we go. That's gonna be nice and even. And then of course too, we can add some topology to this. So I can say, you know what, let's come in here, let's do insert, multiple edge loops, boom, say something like that. And then if we do want, if we don't want the end gone, we want some cleaner topology, Let's go ahead and see if we can get this. So that's not perfectly straight on that. That's actually gonna fail because of that. So that's okay. The end guns aren't gonna show, I'm not worried about that. So let's actually just come through and give me a couple loops here and here. Not really worried about, we're gonna be burying those anyway. And then boom, simple enough. And then here, let's actually send this home, drop this back down, and we can make our adjustments as needed. So here we have just, it's a bit of a weird tripod. So this is why I wasn't worried about making it super perfect, but I'm gonna be using this top edge line, this top edge loop right here as a guide to make sure that they are where I need them to be or get them close enough. So that's kind of like my eyeball measurement. There we go. Say something like that. Now he's on a funky little tripod. Now this chair is way too big. So let's go ahead and just grab here. Let's scale this down. Bring this back up. There we go. Okay, perfect. Yes, any cubic brain and Ender 3 was mentioned. And also just the fact that FDM printers, I recommend FDM printers over resin printers as your first time printer. They'll really show you a lot about the manufacturing process, how 3D printing works. It's fun to watch. Yes, it takes a while, but usually you can get a nice big printer for pretty cheap uh, if you buy FDM, but if you buy resin, then the bigger machines typically cost more. Now, if you're into miniatures, I didn't say this last part, so I'm actually adding onto it. If you're into miniatures and you would like to start printing miniatures, then that's the time I'd be like, resin is the way to go because you can get a nice little resin machine for pretty cheap as well. So a few hundred bucks and you can get something that would print a miniature with no problems. So it's all on what you're trying to achieve ultimately. Okay, let's get some wheels did done made. So we're gonna go ahead and, let's go ahead and put our crane right over here. So I'm gonna stamp them. Stamp them and stamp them. Great, wonderful, let's make some wheels. And again, we have a seat here, so now we're gonna call these the legs. Now I wanna make, I wanna make uh, some wheels. So let's get this guy, let's go solo. Let's do some fun stuff. Let's do some fun stuff. So let's go here with edge loop and not panel loops. Let's go with delete loops. Let's squeeze this down. Let's rotate this around. And let's do let's do some fun stuff. So here, insert multiple edge loops, active in elevation. Say something like that would be fine. And then let's make sure that we're doing this, say something like that. Okay, great. Now here, here's a, here's a fun way to go about, if you want something very specific that's gonna match a certain size here, what we're gonna do is actually hover over an edge and go polygroups. And I'm going to now grab 
all of this right here, say something like that. So selecting both sides, I'm gonna go ahead, hover over the edge and go Q mesh all polygroups. And now I'm going to drag this out, but I can press and hold control to have a separate piece here. So I can just drag this function out on its own, right? And then I can make this its own little thing. I can actually make it joined or whatnot. Um, here, you know, it's like, I wanna add, you know, either like some, I don't know, like some HUD caps or something like that. It's a little HUD caps. <laughs> <laughs> this design's getting weird. All right, so here we're gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna grab this and we're gonna go ahead and split hidden. We'll call this, we'll just rename this one the wheel. The wheels of the bus go round and round and hubcaps, yes. So a lot of times when I'm designing, I also design with just kind of like get everything out there as fast as possible. I'm not really worried about getting it all perfect. What I'm really concerned about is, does this even look good? Does this make sense? All that fun stuff, you know? Just trying to overall hold some sort of design um, and just have fun with it. So here, um, I deleted those edge loops because then I want to add a little bit of a, of a section like this to it. Gonna go ahead and just invert this. Kind of push this up just a little bit. Nice little cap to that. But it's like a nice little custom cap. So, and of course, I ruined this side, which is totally fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and just delete hidden. So geometry, modify topology, delete hidden. Or I could have just said mirror and weld with everything showing. So I could have just said mirror and weld, and that would have that would have done the same thing. There we go. Got my character all turned around. Now I'm seeing the brains. I'm going to go V2. I'm going to turn this on. There we go. Give me something like that. And if we want this to be relatively watertight, let's just come back up here. And again, we're going to do close. Convex, boom, that's fine. Don't know why I did that. We don't need to mask that. There we go. Let's go ahead and select this guy and then let's start scaling this down to make a little bit more sense. Cool, let's come in, let's go ahead and push this in. All right, and then I do wanna create some sort of like wheel weld or base to it. So here we're gonna go ahead and, what we're gonna do on this one actually, we're gonna try something fun. So I'm gonna go ahead and do Control D, Control Shift D, which duplicates, right? And then what I'm gonna do is, actually do I wanna do that way? Sorry, I'm thinking. Do I want to do it like that? That's a great question. You know what? Let's just do this. Let's just do knife. Yeah, that should be fine. Let's do knife curve on that. And then let's actually come in and let's do polygroups group by normals. Yeah, that's perfect. All right, that'll give me that right there. And then I'm actually going to give myself an extra favor and I'm gonna crease my poly groups so that they're nice and clean. And then I'm going to zero mesh this. Now this is super low. This is barely 400, this is barely 400 total points. And zero mesh starts at 5,000 total points. Now we can customize that. Or what we can end up doing is I can divide a few times, get it up to something like 28,000. So then I have something like this. And then I can come through, go back to zero mesher and do my target polys of five, keep groups at zero act, and then um, adaptive size, but I can also keep creases. And that's okay. So now I can come through, maybe turn off. Okay, that's fine. It's, uh, it's currently yelling at me just a little bit. That's okay. It's because the mesh isn't that great. 
So let me come through, do say something like that one more time. Let's make sure that that's something else. Let's do this one more. Let's go key poly group. Let's go zero mesher. Let's do half. Keep those groups. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Much better. Perfect. Great. Then I can blow this up a little bit. And I can also widen that. Bring this in just a teeny bit. And then we'll widen the wheel just a bit. Yeah, there we go. That should work out just fine. Now here, I do want to give this a little bit of like a hollow effect, right? I want this to appear that it's it's shelled out without actually shelling it out. I could shell this out. I could make this a shell. And the way I can do that, let's go ahead and save. I haven't saved in a little bit. And then I'll check chat. So here, I can actually come through here and I can go ahead and delete hidden. So I just selected this bottom piece and I can go ahead and modify topology, delete hidden. So that's gonna automatically do that for me. But what I can do now is I can go with dynamic subdivision, turn on dynamic subdiv, maybe turn smooth down to just like zero at this point, and then I can bring in my thickness. And I can do this. This is one way of going about doing it. Um, the other way about doing it is just to do it manually at this point, right? So I can make this all one poly group, come through here, grab my Z modeler brush, and I can just grab this out and shell it like that. And that's one way. Oh, you know what we could do too? Check this out. This is a fun little trick. If you don't want to scale this down, but you don't want the normals to flip here, like you can't really avoid the normal flipping, but you can push it inward then just come down here to display properties, flip normals, and then boom. Then you got it like that. So you can do that. However, I don't want to do this approach because I do want to 3D print this. And I want this piece, I want the wheel itself to be 100% solid. It's not gonna be able to be rotating. So I'm gonna fake it. And the way to do that is to come in here and actually do inset with, uh, I always butcher this word, custom equisit, <laughs> equisent, equisent snap, custom equisent snap. Hopefully I said that right. And we're gonna do all poly groups. And then uh, I'm gonna lower that down because if I were to have the standard default, so this here is, is uh, what is that? That's usually like 0.25. What happens is sometimes it just doesn't respect the other edge loops and it creates some funkiness to it. I think it was 0.25, I think it was something like that. So sometimes at higher numbers, see if I can get it. To, it's actually, this is actually a pretty clean topology, so it's probably not gonna fail, but um, this right here, you're just gonna inset that. So I usually set that pretty low. Oh, there we go. It's because it's low. Sorry, had it backwards. Because it's low, it's not respecting those other edge loops, but because we're actually going to scale that up, it's going to respect that. It's gonna give it, uh, it's gonna respect it, and it's just gonna be nice. And then from here, I can come in and do Q mesh, and I can start bringing this up. And I kind of just raise that up in there a little bit. So now this will be a nice kind of solid shell. Now that was a little too thin, even for my taste. So let's come here and let's do something a little bit more like that. Um, and then let's go Q mesh. And then again, I'm just gonna tap this up and I'm going to do, no, I actually didn't wanna do that. So let's go like that and bring that up. And then one more time, say something like that. And then here, Again, we can go to crease, crease polygroups. There we go. So that's a little bit nicer at that point. And then here, I'm actually going to skinny this little hub up a little bit. And maybe we'll widen that just to make it believable. Cool. So, yay. Who needs Ds anyway? Exactly. You're 100% correct, man. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay, let me let me let me check let me check chat here real quick. Sorry guys. Uh 
Let's see. Do, 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 do. Bamboo A1 is one of the best entry level printers nowadays. Awesome. Yeah. I don't I don't actually FDM print as much anymore. Um, just because I have a lot of resin printers. Let's see here. Do 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 do. Uh, how to make perfect topology? How to make perfect read topology, Jay? So, um, you know, a lot of it is just understanding the science of of the actual topology, the way the edge loop should go. For hard surface, the key rule is if it deforms, no triangles. If it does, if it so if it deforms, no triangles. If it doesn't deform, triangles are usually okay. So it just depends. You want to minimize as many triangles and next to no end gons as possible. You don't want a ton of end gons because they don't smooth much at all. They're terrible. End gon smoothing is bad, so you don't want that. So yes, in game engines, things typically get triangulated anyway, but for the ease of use when you're rigging, when you're setting up for um, any type of just getting clean mesh for, you know, for UV unwrapping, you want nice, even quads. You want them to be nice and good. You want it to to support the mesh as much as possible. So, um, so it's a, it's kind of an open-end question because perfect topology is the best topology you can get. So whatever you can get, that's the best. And if you're looking at your mesh and you're like, I can do better, then it's not perfect. It's perfect as is equal to as close as good as you can get, or until your team says, Hey, good job, move on to the next thing. Um, so, yeah. It's, it's the best way I can answer that question. Do, 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 do. You want to see thumbnails of ZBrush? I can't help you with 3DS. So I, I, I don't work for Autodesk, but uh, for ZBrush, uh, thumbnails in your window so you can see what's going on. I, I, you know, I, can, I can push that forward and, and just say, hey, you know, is this possible? And maybe that could be a future update. So I'll keep that. I'll write that down, actually. Because I actually, that's a good idea. <laughs> I like that. Let's see here. Um, uh, Ian, uh, do you by any chance uh, know what the circle option on crease level slider is for? I can't find anything about it. Remaining light says, oh, I okay, this was a question I was hunting for because I saw you asked it earlier. Okay, so um, the thing to remember, this nice little, this nice little uh, bubble here. So ZBrush is full of these little bubbles everywhere. I want you to think of this bubble as another algorithm in the way it works. It just, it's a lot of times it's work, it works for, um, it really just helps with the algorithm. It's just another way of going about it. It's the easiest way to explain it because for example, Dynamesh has a bubble and it's just functioning the way that it does. Now, a lot of times, if you don't know, if you hover over a shape, like let's say crease level, right? And I hold control, it's gonna tell me exactly what this thing does. This is called auto note. So if you didn't know it exist, now it does. Now the thing is, is that um, what that bubble does 100%, I can't actually remember. So if auto notes don't tell me, we're gonna find out together. Um, I usually don't push that button. So I, let's see, do, 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 do. It might be the way it's smoothing. Okay, so let's find out. So first off, crease level. Level 15, subdivision level 15 is like, it's going to respect the creasing all the way up to subdivision level 15, which is pretty much like, I think the highest you can go, if I remember right. So when you drop this down, let's explain that part first. Let's, we have this, right? Right now it's at 15. So if I subdivide, 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 it's gonna keep this as sharp as possible all the way up until subdivision level 15, okay? Now, if I take this down to say subdivision level two, now if I start subdividing and subdividing, subdividing, you'll notice now you're getting a nice fall off. And that fall off is there to actually, because now it's saying, okay, well, we're gonna increase that edge, but at su past subdivision level two, now we're gonna start smoothing it out a little bit. And that's okay. So that gives you a little bit more of a controlled look to it. Now let's turn the bubble off for a second. Let's go back to subdivision level 15. And let's see if I notice a major change, which I do not. Okay, so let's drop it down to level two. Let's do the same thing. So I'm not seeing any major changes on that. So it could be just the way that it is smoothing. And right now, I cannot tell the difference. 
Okay, hold on. So let me see something. If I go back down. Oh, let me see something. Hold on. I think I might have figured it out. Let's see here. Nope, did not. Did not figure it out. Okay, you know what? I'm not sure what that bubble specifically does because it doesn't seem to be doing much of anything for me. So I will find out and I will see if I can get an answer for you by my next stream, which is next Wednesday. So, yep, stumped. Not quite sure. I'm not noticing a major difference. So it could just be a different algorithm in which it's just the way it's respecting the crease. Um, but I cannot tell you. It's not making any sense to me at the moment. So, but great question. I'm actually going to note this down. So great stuff. I'll find out. Let's back up in time. Okay. Perfect. There we go. Let's just mask that off. Get the history. Boom. Bada bing, bada boom. Great question though. Okay, great. Any news on ZBrush for the iPad? R ask. R, we're going to be having news soon. We are in development of it right now. And so trust me, myself and half the team that is currently sweating on it and the other half that is currently sweating on it to make it as awesome as possible. Everybody on the team is super excited to uh, release it and we wanna make it the best version possible. This is actually part of the biggest part of our year. So what I can tell you is more information is to come and you know we're gonna be updating people as soon as possible. We wanna make sure that you guys get exactly what you want and what we can produce. So in order to do that, we've taken in a lot of consideration in what people have said as far as the feedback. We've been watching the community talk about it. You guys have been asking for ZBrush for iPad for years now. So believe you me, we've actually done some good market research. We're really on our way to make sure that we're providing the best version of ZBrush for iPad possible and really have a good solid launch. So um, as we announced it on the summit, ZBrush for iPad is coming in 2024, but more news on that soon. Uh, so please stay tuned and don't worry. We're, we're really, really focused on making it as best as possible. So trust me, I'm really excited for it. I'm gonna be doing a lot of fun stuff. And as soon as I'm allowed to say more, I will definitely tell you, trust me. Okay. Again, I can't tell you more than what I just told you, but I think you all are gonna be really excited for it. So stay tuned, trust me, okay? <laughs> Stay tuned. I'm really, I'm really, really, really jazzed. I, I cannot wait to talk about it more. I want to talk about it so bad, but I can't. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right. I'm going to uncrease this bad boy because I do want this to be nice and round. I want a nice round shape to that. But here's the thing. I want a nice round shape to this, but not the rest. And by smoothing this, this is giving me too much. So let's do some edge loop control. So I'm actually gonna use my Z modeler, hover over an edge, insert single edges. And now this is a trick I do quite often where I'll come through and I'll add some supporting edge loops closer to the edge, which will give me a little bit better sharpness control, natural fall off that I know will be respected well when we smooth this mesh um, in other applications. So I know that's gonna remain nice and sharp and not really relying on the, um, on the creased edging spot. So I want that to be nice and sharp, but have like a little bit of softness to it. Awesome. Okay, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna come through here and I'm gonna grab and insert primitive, insert. So I want a cylinder with no edge loops here. And what I would like to do is drag this out and push this in like this. And then let's grab my insert. Let's grab an edge. Let's drag this over here. And then here, this is going to be showcased. This is going to be facing. So let's grab my uh, 
hitting too many buttons. Okay, so let's grab this guy and I'm gonna drag this out. Say something like that. It's gonna let me do this. Hold on one second. No, it's not because, why? Because I don't have proper polygroups. So let's go here, polygroups, and let's go um, group by normals. And then let's make sure that we do a mirror and weld. Great, we're gonna drag this out. Rotate that around, say it's just the right shape. There we go, mesh fusion, perfect. So, and then we're gonna go ahead and, perfect, we're gonna have that. We're gonna make that, that shape right there. And we're gonna go ahead and have that right there. Awesome, that way we can select this. So it looks like that, there we go. Now it looks like it has an axle right where we want it to be, which is good. And then here, I'm gonna give this a little bit of a lip. So right now it's colliding. I have this the mesh kind of colliding inwards a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and grab this. I'm gonna add in some single edge loops. I actually want this to be perfectly in the middle. So I'm gonna go multiple edge loop, I'm gonna go uh, specified elevation, and I'm going to just pick this one and that one. So then we have something that looks like this. So this gives me just a little bit more control here. In fact, actually what we might be able to do is let's just go ahead and scale this down and then bring this up. There we go. Yeah, I think that'll be a little bit nicer. Okay. And then here, I think I wanna push this in a little bit. So I'm gonna grab this, soften this wheel up a little bit, and then, why did that happen? What happened there? Hmm, okay, that's cool. Uh, which transpose? I didn't pick transpose cloth, did I? No. Let's grab that guy right there. Let's come in here. There we go. So we're gonna scale this in just a little bit. Get a little bit of a bowed action on that wheel. Yeah, that's a bit better. There we go. Yep, I think that's gonna be cool. All right. That'll give me pretty close to what I'm looking for. So let's go ahead and save it. Let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. So you're sculpting a male head, decided to insert sphere uh, for the ear. And after sculpting the ear, I merged the ear to the head. But when I dynamesh, the ear disappeared from the head. Um, okay, so in that case, Sheriff, probably what happened was your resolution was really low and there wasn't enough vertices to control that. Um, that's the main, but outside of that, I couldn't tell you another reason why that would happen. I'm trying to think. There we go. It's a little bit better. Nice little lip on that. Um, yeah, if you're using Dynamesh, then it could just be super low resolution. So let me let me show you an example. So let's let's go here. Let's grab let's go grab his body. I'm gonna hit solo for a second. I just saved it, so no big deal. So let's say here we're gonna hit Dynamesh. So I'm gonna find out the resolution of this and hit Dynamesh. And now we've we've lost our subdivisions at this point. And then let's go ahead and let's reduce it. So here, you can already see just in reducing how much lower I went. Now let's go ahead and grab an insert mesh. Let's grab this cylinder right here. Let's drag this out. Let's make this here. Let's do something like this, okay? So I'm oversimplifying it, I understand, but let's, this, let's see if this was kind of something what you were talking about. Then I'm gonna dynamesh, then I'm gonna dynamesh again. 
and now my ears mostly gone that could be it it could just be not enough resolution so i would increase the resolution and give that a shot and that will retain that information a little bit better um unless you accidentally hit it unless you did this one of these things but no you dynamesh so that doesn't make any sense because even if i were to dynamesh this let's delete lower let's hit dynamesh let's come here yeah that's not gonna that's not gonna do anything so the hiding shouldn't play a factor so that, that might that's the only thing i can really think of off the top of my head um the only other thing is if you're on solo and you're using imm so you're on solo imm you're dynameshed and you drag this out it will disappear but in the re dynamesh process it shouldn't shouldn't cause Resolution would be the only th only factor, I think. So if you were to have again low resolution, that's gonna that's gonna tear that up because it's only going to. So you may try. I would say try increasing the resolution. You might be super low. Most of the time, resolution starts at sixty four. And something to know about Dynamesh two. Here, let's back up in time just a little bit. Something to know about Dynamesh. Okay. Okay. Let's go here, let's delete lower. So resolution 144 and size. The size of your of your scene versus your resolution. These two correlate with each other a lot. Okay, so for example, here's 144, right? I'm gonna go picker. Okay, 280. So here's 280 resolution. All right, 280. Let's remember that number for a second. So I'm gonna go ahead and just put this mesh right here. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale this up. Okay, so now the scale went from 2 to 8.5 overall. Now I'm going to go ahead and Dynamesh this. So, same resolution, 280. Look how dense that is. That's super dense, right? Now, so the bigger something is, resolution 280, it's correlating to the size, and that's going to give you a much different size. Now let's shrink this down. And let's go smaller. So now we went from 2 to 0.3. Okay. And again, we're going to go 280, that resolution. That's important. I'm going to hit Dynamesh. Look how small that is. So the size matters. So that's why actually um, a few years ago, uh, before I even joined the Maxon team, I actually showed a trick with Stager. Uh, this is quite helpful when you're trying to work on parts with Dynamesh with, that are going to be really small, but you really just don't want, you want to work in Dynamesh. And you don't want to zebra mesh. You just want to work in Dynamesh. You're just sketching stuff out. You need something small. What you can do is do home stage, right? So let's say we have something super small. So I'm going to go really, really small. I'm going to home stage this, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale it up. And I'm going to target stage this. Now, the thing here is that what I can do is on the target stage with my Dynamesh at resolution 280. Again, let's turn that on. Okay, that's super low at this point, so let's go bigger than that. So let's go stager. Let's turn that target stage off. Let's go big. Let's go really big. Let's look at our size. What we got? That's still two, four. Perfect. Target stage. So now if I switch to home stage, I got 0 0.03. That's really small. I switch again. I'm here. So now I can go ahead and Dynamesh. Let's go 280. Dynamesh this. Now I can work on this size here. So now I can go ahead and sculpt, do my detailing, right? Come in, boom, boom. This is, I'm super happy with this. Now I can go back to stager and I can switch stage. And as long as I don't read Dynamesh, I can have this guy really, really small and work with that. But as soon as I do that, as soon as I Dynamesh, you're gonna lose all your information. So you just gotta be careful with that. It's my, my thing, but that's, that's a thing that you can absolutely do, so. Let me back up in time. Here, let's go back up in time. But hopefully that helps you. Wee! Backing up to my. Oh, I don't know. Nope, I'm going way too far back. Let's just. I saved it. So let's go load tool. Let's go here. Let's just open it. 
Perfect. All right. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, what do we got? So we still have some time, which is awesome. All right, let's go ahead and let's now shape some of these together. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to... I have clean topology on my wheel, uh, my wheel, my hubcaps, all that stuff. So actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Uh, let's call this wheel cap. And then I'm going to merge these with my wheel and cap. So I'm just gonna go ahead and just merge down. So this right here has no subdivisions. It's just being smooth naturally. This one has subdivision level four. So I'm gonna match this. So I'm gonna turn off dynamic subdivision and I'm going to manually smooth to subdivision level four. I'm gonna come on up to one and then I'm gonna go ahead and merge down. And when I do this, it's gonna merge things together, but it's gonna keep my subdivisions. So I want to be able to switch between subdivision level one and subdivision level four. And that's the way you can do that, especially if you have that connection. So now, and then this is the main wheel, which is perfect. So now let's go back to V1 where everything is living. I'm gonna go ahead, grab my pizza box. Let's scale this down. Now I'm gonna move. I'm actually going to duplicate this. So I'm gonna make this a little easier on myself. I'm gonna duplicate one of these. I'm just gonna put this in the back. Say, actually I'm gonna scale this up. Yeah, I'm gonna scale this one up. That's fine. Eh, that's too big. Maybe something like that. Great, wonderful. Let's take this one. Let's delete it. And then I'm gonna duplicate this, Control Shift D. Move this up in here. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. I had the pizza box on there still. Wait, what? What happened? Oh, right. <laughs> I'm silly. There we go. Let's move this down. There we go. Let's go ahead and, nope, I mean, let's just hide all this stuff. Yeah, let's touch this one, let's touch this one. Perfect. Let's move that over here. Yeah. Let's go ahead and do that. Can even rotate that just a little bit if we wanted to. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Say something like that, okay. Groovy, and then from here, let's just go ahead and mirror and weld. Mirror and weld, and mirror and weld. Right, delete lower, mirror and weld, rebuild. Awesome, so there we go. So I got some wheels on our guy. The wheels on the bus. All right, let's hit save. I've been doing more 3D design, more design for th printing and ZBrush and wondering how you can snap an object to another. Looks like Jason actually, you, the answer was uh, that you actually, let me know if that, um, that answer worked out for you, the contact functionality. And then the IMM brush can do that too. Yeah, so when you're snapping stuff together, so here, anytime you're using an IMM brush, it's going to snap to a vertice. It's just how it works. It's going to take that vertice normal. And in this case here, hold on, it's because I, um, I have subdivisions. So if you don't have any subdivisions and you're dragging this out, it's going to go on that facing normal. And what you can do actually, so it's going to follow that normal. If I hold shift, then it's going to snap off of that a little bit. So here it's always pulling off of that front facing normal, the direction of that normal. So as I drag this out, so this is a way to go about getting that to be snapped correctly to it. There's also a couple other things too that you can do. Um, the contact one was new. Uh, before I go over that one, there's an actual align function here. And so if you need it every, if you need certain things to align 
to, let's say, the dead center or the bottom or the top, whatever, all this fun stuff. You could use the align function. This is really meant for like, I need to align these wheels. So I'm gonna pick these wheels right here. And I want these to align. Should be that way. Does that work that way? Mm, maybe not. Okay, maybe we can't work with that. So I think it's just visibility at this point. So let me do visibility V2. Let me hide everything except for this wheel and yeah, the wheels I have selected and these two. And let's say these wheels are off center here and I need to align, then I can snap these visible subtools to that wheel and make it perfectly aligned. But in the case of like what was asked about like one object to another, IMM will do that. And then there is the new contact feature, which Paul was showing off. Um, a little bit, which I believe only works on the main sub tool. So let me grab this rivet right here. If I remember right. Okay, cool. So we have this bolt here and I want to snap it to this point. So the new contact will allow this to happen. So um trying to remember it one second so point here c2 is that correct oh my gosh you know what one second let me actually just pull you to the right video source my brain is blanking i apologize give me one second um if you don't have 2024 then this won't work for you. The contact is still the same. Um, let me see here real quick. I'll actually point you to a Cineversity video that was done by Michael Pavlovich. He, he'll explain it a little bit better than I could at this point if he did it. Where is it? If not, we have one at Cineversity. I'll just go to our stream. Let me see real fast. Okay, where do we show it? And I'll point you straight to that. I believe it was here. One second. I'll get you the video for it. I'll tell you the timestamp. Now Patrick did that one. I was actually in Miami when we did this one. That's always fun. Or was this earlier than that? Maybe it was 2023. One second. I want to get you the right video. Okay. is always such a fun tune. Oh my God, we have so many videos. <laughs> All right, here. Just, where did I put it? Mm -mm -mm. Should make an app. We're gonna we're gonna make an ass brush on this one. Actually, this will be a good one to do. So this one's a little interesting. Where is it? Give me one second, guys. Apologize. What? I'm trying to remember when we dropped it. 2024, was it 2024 new features or 2023? Ugh. Maybe it was in point two. Uh, here it was. This is where it was. We dropped it in 2023.2, I think. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Here it is. Found it. All right. So let's share this on the timestamp. 
thanks for bearing with me here. Started at 53.8. This is where you want to go. This is the contact point for 2023.2. So it's new in 2023.2 and in 2024. There you go. All right, so there's the video. Let me know if that helps you out as well. So is there a, if you need an IMM to be exactly two millimeter, is there a way to force that to happen? Actually, yes, there is, Jason. Um, there is actually a plugin for that. Uh, it was written by Joseph Drust a while ago. Uh, let me see here. I don't have it installed for me, um, but let me see if I can get you a link to that and I can explain what that does. It is called IMM Draw Size. So this should be the link to it. So here, let me drop that in the chat. Boop. I don't think I have it installed, I'll double check. So right here, IMM Draw Size. Um, here, let me see if I can just download that real fast. Just to make sure that I have it. Do I have it? Nope, do not have it. Okay, so let me go ahead and save that real fast. And then, of course, let me install it. So if you're unfamiliar with how to install, All right, let's go program files. So we need to go to our latest version of ZBrush. We need to go to startup Z plugin 2024. I can open this one up here. I'm gonna pull this off because I don't remember what's in my downloads. So let's go over here. I'm gonna extract. And you're gonna grab the, once you extract it, you're gonna grab these two items here. Go ahead and just cut those out. And then we we'll just go ahead and paste those in there. So now your draw size should be there. Or you could just drag and drop it. If you already have it, it'll say, hey, you know, it's no longer in there, whatever. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So do we have, where is it in there? IMM draw size. Where are we? There it is. All right, just took a minute to transfer over. No big deal. All right. Now we need to restart ZBrush. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, there we go. Go ahead and just load our scene. It's like boom. Of course, here's the rest of our scene. Yay, there he is. Okay, great. Stamp him over here. Okay. So now we have IMM draw size here. And what's fun is that five millimeter desired. So if you wanted to have something like two millimeter desired, you can do that. So then Let's grab here. Let's actually grab. What do we want to grab? Let's just grab industrial parts. Let's take our plugin. Let's stick it. Let's actually stick our plugin just over here so we can see that. So here we could set our draw size. And notice too that, like, so I had my brush kind of big, right? So desire IMM draw size two millimeter. That's what I want. Look at my how big my brush is itself. I'm gonna click that now. Look how that is. Um, and if I press and hold Control as I drag that out, it's gonna respect that draw size. So I'm drawing out. Press and hold Control. Draw. Press and hold Control. Draw. Press and hold Control. So I can set that to be that two millimeter that I'm looking for. I want it to be set to five. I set to five. So dragging it out press and hold it and it I have sorry I have to set the draw size then drag that out press and hold it press and hold it press and hold it so every time you make this adjustment so you want this to be one millimeter set that size drag it out boom 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 so that's how you do it so that plugin is the is yeah it's super cool 
So if you're looking for specifics, that's the way to go. Yeah, super useful. Just make sure you set it. That's the, that's the key part. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Let's, uh... So, so again, so, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, all words and things. So this is where we got so far. So we kind of dragged this out a little bit and just kind of working with it. We need to refine his shapes a little bit more, um, but we have, we have a lot or we have enough information here to start looking at the refine process a little bit. Now he's a brain, so he's soft tissue, right? So I actually want him to be a little squished um, against this stuff right here. So here, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and let this let this kind of be smooth a bit. So I want his body to kind of squish around this chair naturally. And this is where the cloth simulation can come into play. So first off, let's get a lower resolution. That's always gonna be super helpful. When you're working with the dynamic system, you don't want it to be too high because it's gonna take a lot longer to process, okay? And then from here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and grab this chair right here. Now, it's important to give yourself some space in the beginning, okay? And then what we're gonna do is go up to dynamics. Let's dock this on the left-hand side. And we're gonna turn off gravity because we don't really want gravity right now. And then we're also going to turn on collision volume. It's gonna make sure that ZBrush will recognize all the visible subtools and how it can collide. And then we're also going to take inflate and we're gonna drop that pretty low. I like to drop that like 0.2 to start. And then you can always hit recalculate if you are ready to go. And now what we're gonna do, okay, is I'm basically going to, at this point, take the shape here. I'm gonna use the transpose cloth like this guy and boom so we're gonna bring the brain actually let's do this let's grab let's grab the transpose regular let's actually bring this a little closer say cool that looks good now let's actually go and let's hide Let's hide everything except for his body at this point. Let's recalculate this scene. There we go. Let's grab here. Nope, bring that seat back. Okay. And now we're gonna take the transpose cloth with the brain and we're gonna start bringing this down and then it's going to now deform around this chair so we can actually get some nice effects. So here, let's back it up. You can see here, it's actually gonna start pressing in on that just a little bit. And that's gonna just give us a little bit more of a visual interest. There we go. And then here, let's actually go back and then we're going to pick the, let's go V4, we're gonna pick the eyes and then let's go ahead and grab the regular transpose, turn everything else back on. I want this guy and this guy, everything else. And we're just gonna bring this back down. There we go. Get that back in there. So now we got a little bit of a squish factor and we can play with this the rest of the way. Let's get our alpha 18 back. We can now start working on this just a little bit. There we go. Now startup material is a little white. Let's go basic material. There we go. So it just helps us get a little bit more squishy. Let's go BDS, BDS for damn standard. There we go. You need to make more time in my process and discover, play around with some new features. Absolutely, Jason. I definitely agree. Nice. Can we do it the other way around as in you want the hard service to squeeze uh, in the other sub tool? Yes. 
Yeah, you could do it the other way around. It's just the usually typically something hard isn't going to be crushed. Um, however, I actually did it the other way around when I did my um, when I did my Stranger Things uh, Demi Gorgon sculpt. I needed his foot to crush a oil barrel or a toxic barrel, and so I did that the other way around. I took his foot and I moved his foot um, in position, and then I took the barrel. And then I moved the barrel up and ran into his foot. So anything that you have that's selected is going to be the thing that deforms. So you just choose the opposite item. Um, it cannot change. Like the one you have selected is the one that's going to be affected. Does that make sense? So if you wanted the hard object to be affected, then you need to select the hard object. If you need the soft objects affected, then you select the soft object. You can't switch between the two at the moment where you're like, oh, affect this one, not the other. But... It is definitely just pick the one that you want and then and then you're good to go. Hopefully that made sense. I'm saying it out loud in my head and I'm like, they even did that compute. Let's give him a butt chin. There we go. Gonna give him a little bit. There we go. So you know what we'll do next week is uh, next week we'll focus a little bit more on um, optimizing the mesh, getting the details going, and then uh, getting a. We'll do some we'll do some animation stuff with him. I think that's gonna be fun. We can move him into cinema. Um, we can texture him in substance. So it, there can be some really cool stuff that we can do with this project. And that way too, I'll show you guys the pipeline and the workflow and all the tools used which will be a lot of fun. There we go. Okay, we need to give him some eyelids. So I'm just gonna sculpt them in because ZBrush will recognize the actual, uh, it'll recognize the other um, underlining topology. And I'll respect that. So it'll wrap around. So if I were to hide this, you could see it's starting to wrap around that shape. And actually, what we could do too, let's do this. So I have I have them having some pretty big, yes, uh, eyebrows here, but I need to get underneath these. So I'm going to dial these back just a little bit. So then I can come underneath get the eyelids because usually the eyelids are again you got your brow bone and then your eye lid is underneath everybody's a little different but I want them to have some eyelids right so we're gonna do something like this smooth that down just a little bit there we go and again if we need to support ourselves you know have a little bit of uh, non-colliding we can turn on back face mask have this come in now we can start building up again given those those sockets he deserves now something kind of cool and uh, let's go b m v for move um so the lower eyelids are usually if you look at your own face or you look at other people's faces from the side You'll notice that the upper eyelid is a little bit further out and the lower eyelid is further in. So it's like a nice step effect. So it'll typically look like this, where you'll have one, two, three, four. You'll have a stepping effect. So your eyebrow, eyelid, you'll have something like that. So you'll have this kind of step effect. And that's what I'm aiming for at the moment right now. So I'm kind of pulling this back, kind of correcting the shape just finding some appeal in his face. And same thing here. So bring this up just a little bit. And actually, let's go here, geometry. So find the topology a little bit. Let's subdivide up just a teeny bit. So B, D, S. Or damn standard. There we go. All right. 
right. Let's give him some weird, some weird shapes in his mouth. Scale this up just a little bit. There we go. Okay. Like in the direction. All right. I don't think he actually has a nose, but this is where I'm gonna go back to my concept. Nope, he does not have a nose and that is okay. But we could give him a mouth bag. That should be really fun. Now, again, I'm not really focused on detailing so much, but we should give him some sort of mouth bag here. And then that way we can at least get him somewhat prepped for, at least, you know, ideally prepped for some animation. Um, so probably we'll do a, retopol a manual retopology if we don't get 100% what we want, but we're, we're, we are going for a little bit close enough. So I'm gonna do a little, a little something fun. I'm gonna mask off his eye, straighten that up, and I'm gonna go ahead and Control W to give me a good mask. Actually, you know what? Let's do, let's do an older technique. In fact, for the, let's do this. Actually, I'm gonna go a little bit different. Let's go here, color. I'm gonna fill it with white. Then I'm gonna choose pure black. 100% pure black, zero, 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 boom. Black looks awesome. Okay, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to, uh, we're gonna go preferences, tablet, turn off tablet. Why? Because I don't want the pen pressure. I actually want this to be really nice and sharp as much as possible. In fact, so sharp that I'll even turn the focal shift down to negative 100 to give me that effect. Okay, and what I'm gonna do now I'm gonna come through here, the small brush. And this is really cool too. We can actually go lazy mouse, lazy radius up. And I'm going to focus on getting some loops like this. There we go. Yes, like that, that should be good. Okay, that's fine, that's perfect. <clears throat> now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up here to Z plugin, which I had it docked over here. There we go, let's scroll down and we're gonna go polygroup it and we're gonna go polygroup it from paint. So I'm gonna say polygroup from paint, let's wait for it. Boom, perfect. Now it's giving me some nice, some nice poly groups here and there. Now what I'm gonna do is that's what I want actually. So I'm gonna mask these section off here and get my poly groups back there as well. Okay, and now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do, we don't really need to do a mirror and weld because the poly groups, we're gonna Z remesh this and it's fine, but we need to clean up this topology a little bit. This topology looks pretty gross. So I'm gonna go ahead and just fill this, I'm sorry, not with true black. We're gonna fill this with white. So come back over here to color fill object, yay. But now we can take a look at this and you see here how all this is kind of, ugh, it's not good. Okay, so we need to fix this. So what we're gonna do, easiest way, is I just put a history marker right up here at the top and I'm gonna come up here to deformation and I'm gonna polish by groups. Boop. And polish by groups immediately did a good job cleaning that up. The other thing you can do is head up into the light box, go up to brush, go up to smooth, and we have a smooth groups. So double click that, say yep, that's fine. Turn off uh, RGB at this point and then you could start smoothing the groups and get them a little bit more the way you'll wanna see them, a little bit smoother. The smoother these groups are, the 
straighter the line, the easier it is for zebra mesher to do its job. So we're gonna come in here and really pay attention to this. Now I am smoothing the topology as well. Smooth groups doesn't just smooth um, only the groups, but it's affecting the topology around the groups as well. But it is doing a good job maintaining a lot of the others, not just smoothing everything, so it won't just destroy it. But you could see here, those are clear definitions of those groups. So I'm just kind of smoothing in those areas and making them nice and purdy. Okay, great. Once I'm happy with this, and I'm pretty happy with this, so we're gonna go ahead and just kind of, let's just go ahead and just put this right here on the side. So there we go. So I'm gonna just stamp this. Okay, great. So I'm stamping that in there just so we can have a kind of a before and after. So you can guys kind of see. Okay, great. So here we go. And now we're going to do the same thing. So we're going to go Z uh, geometry, zebra measure. Now we have about half a million vertices at this point. So I don't like starting so low at the target polygon of 5,000. 5,000 to cover all of this, and is that, that's a lot to, to, to respect the geometry. I want to kick this up a little bit. So remember that this number is in thousands, so 5,000. So I'm going for, you know, I'm taking half a million and I'm dialing that down. Now, zebra mesher is quite powerful, but I like to I like to actually say let's go for some success. So I'm only going to ask to do fifty thousand. So I'm going to start with fifty thousand, and then I'm going to say keep groups down. Same thing, adapt size down to zero, smooth keep groups down to zero, and now I'm going to go ahead and say zebra mesh, and let's see what results we get. Now, the more smaller clumps of groups you have, the more chance of failure. So you wanna make sure that you have just really the important groups that you're looking for. There we go. Okay, so that's not too bad. That took us down to 84,000. So I'm gonna say half. I'm gonna do this again. I'm gonna see how low we can go without it being super ridiculous. Not too bad, that's 34,000. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that's not too bad. So you can see here now those groups are having the, at least a lot of the, the edge flow work in my favor. It's not perfect by any means, but it at least has given me a good opportunity to maintain that shape and make this really useful for sculpting and maybe eventually doing some quick texture work before manual retopology, if I just want to just kind of satisfy that thing. Now, but also too, notice here, what's cool is that I have some good edge loops in here that I could probably use to create a mouth bag. So we went from this nasty mesh to this mesh here. Rodolfo, what's up, dude? How's it going? We've got like 10 more minutes. We're making a mouth bag right now for this guy. So good, good timing. Sup, sup. All right, so now what we're gonna end up doing is we're going to project some of our detail back on the lowest resolution. So this is 14,000, this is pretty low. So now I'm gonna go here to Subtool, I'm gonna go to Project, and I'm gonna project my history. And it's asking if I wanna take the poly paint with, recognize that I had a poly paint. I'm gonna say no, I don't need that. But now I, I went from here to here, which is fine. So this is pretty good, okay? And then now what I'm gonna do is we're gonna take the Z modeler brush and we're gonna start creating our mouth. So I'm gonna select the section right in here. So I'm doing a temporary selection at the moment. Boom, boom, boom. Up, oh, deleted an edge loop, didn't mean to do that. Okay, pretty good. Actually, I'm gonna do this top part too. Nope, didn't mean to do that. So I'm gonna do a total of three loops here. Okay. 
Perfect. So I got this right here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and grab this Q mesh, all my poly groups. I'm going to drag this back. Oh, okay. What happened here? Ah, okay. 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 So it's trying to snap to this one. So I'm actually going to, you know what? Let's do this. Let's do this. I'm actually going to delete this top row here. We're going to do single. Or we'll do double, actually. It's not liking this loop right here. That's okay. We can work with this. Okay, that's fine. So I'm going to push this in. I'm going to push this in a lot, actually. So let's do, let's do a little bit here and then... Boom. Let's get something like that. Okay, now what we can do is we can come in here. Oh, what is that doing up there? <laughs> it grabbed this too. Why did it grab that too? Okay, okay, okay. Well, that could, that, could, that could cause some conflict there. So let's step that back just a little bit. All right, it's no big deal. There we go. We got a bit of a mouth in there. Okay, now we have this guy, which is perfectly fine. Yeah, we just got some, some, no big deal. Let's do this. So we're gonna go ahead and now we're gonna do double so we can see the inside of that mesh. And now I'm gonna take inflate here. One second, so I'm gonna infer, I'm gonna mask this off. Back this up, back this up. I'm gonna come in here, mask, back this up. There we go. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of smooth this out a little bit. I'm gonna take my move. I'm gonna start pulling this out. There we go, Let's say something like that. Let's grab our Z. I'm gonna add some edge loops here. So you're gonna add in some edge loops here and here. So we could start, there we go. And again, we're going to invert this, mask this off. There we go. And we're gonna take the inflate. So B, I, N. I'm gonna hold Alt. And then here I'm gonna kinda of just do like a little bit of an inflate, smooth, inflate, smooth, inflate, smooth. I want to pay attention to where the mouth bag itself is being pulled. So I'm using the head as reference. Throats go down. So we're going to do the same thing. Okay. And what this is going to do is give me a nice shadow the inside. Okay, so here, that's a little too much. There we go. Okay, and now I'm gonna come here to geometry, same zero mesh this. Yeah, it's gonna be a little bit better. Come in here. Little TLC, and I'm actually going to, I'm choosing the wrong smooth, so let me get the smooth, smooth one here. There we go. It's gonna be a little bit better. Give me a little bit better result. There we go. Yes, there we go. Now we have a mouth on the inside, and if I were to render this, you can now see I'm actually getting some shadow work in there. So now I'll actually be able to use this to have his mouth open and close for a little bit. Okay, making progress. Let's go ahead and hit save. In the nick of time, yep, boom. I am, absolutely. Yep, Crane is next, yep.
We'll finish him next week as uh, finish him off next week. This is a pretty good block out for now. Lots of great questions, by the way, guys. Good job. So this is where we got to today. So we have a lot of fun stuff that we pretty much covered. And so now we're going to go ahead and just set him off over here. You know what? Let's do this. Let's see this character come to life a little bit. And the way we're going to do that, we're just going to go ahead and let's let's go ahead and grab that kind of pinkish tone. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So we're going to go ahead and say, yep, let's go ahead and fill this here. Let's go ahead and get kind of a grayish color. It's a little dark. It's a little dark, Ian. You don't want that. Let's go kind of a cool blue. Let's go fill object. And we also need like this. So this is, quote, the block out, right? This is exactly the thing where it's like, okay, this gives us enough information. And now we want to kind of go through and redefine all the shapes that we need. Finish building. We'll go through and start finish building the rest of this. Let's get his eyes. I'll show you something I do with eyes quite often, actually. This is pretty cool. So with eyes, I like to do this. Toy plastic. So I'm going to go ahead and with material and color, I'm going to go ahead and fill that. And then let's go back to our standard material, say something like this. And then what I'm going to do with these eyes real fast is I'm going to grab the paintbrush. And I'm going to go ahead and at the back of the eyes, nice big paintbrush. I'm going to go red. Nope, not material, color. Uh, and also I got focal shift a little too high. There we go, something like that, right? And that's actually RGB intensity is a little much. There we go. Say so something like that. So you'll have a little bit of that redness coming through, which is always so cool. Just enough to show that there's a little bit of life there. And then with black, I'm gonna come in with a really soft brush. Gonna paint a little AO. Just help it look a little bit more, a little bit more lifelike, just a teeny, teeny bit. And then same thing here on the teeth. I'm actually gonna go ahead and I don't like true white teeth. I kind of like a little bit more of a bone color. So I'm gonna go RGB and the material and kind of get it something like that. There we go. Cool, now his teeth are a little funky. Let's just fix that real quick. So I'm gonna grab this guy. Let's move this down here. Actually. There we go. All right. Yeah, it's a little bit better. Cool. Just a little bit of color. Perfect. All right, so that's where we're ending up today. Great questions, everybody. This was super fun. I really enjoy hanging out with everyone. Welcome back to 2024. So we're going to be doing a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of neat stuff happening uh, in the near future. So definitely check a lot of that out. And thank you guys for sticking along. If you also want to know a lot of what is to come, we always do events and stuff like that. So if you go to maxon.net and you come up here to news and events, then you'll absolutely see the stuff that we're doing from my live streams to you know all the events that we're going on around the world where we'll be. Also to things like VFX and Chill. These guys are amazing. If you wanna know more about the film industry and VFX and how our tools are used, definitely go check that out. Um, a lot of fun stuff, but more importantly, if you're a student, uh, this one's important. If you're a student and you want to get ZBrush for a super affordable price, we do have a student teacher licensing. For the U.S., it's $20 for the year, which gives you all of Maxim One, including ZBrush, Redshift, Cinema, Red Giant, all that fun stuff. So it's definitely worth the deal. Uh, so if you are a student, definitely check that out. I'm going to put that in the link. So, yeah. All right. Thank you guys for showing up. Let's see. Um, 
definitely in Boston, right? You know, Boston sounds cool. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you guys so much again for hanging out and showing up. And I will see you guys next week, same time, 10 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So you guys enjoy it, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye, 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 bye.